So 419 mile in high school. That's going back a long time now. I, I can't even imagine it. You know, it's like when you're in training, you're just thinking about how can I get down to, you know, the elite uh, 412 or 415 or whatever. And he had, you know, the highest level of confidence. But I wrote a book about him. It's called How Lance Does It. And he just had this, the, the most ideal competitive mindset I've ever seen. Confidence in his own abilities and his ability to stay focused and work hard. And also like complete fearlessness of not only winning, but fearless, if not fearing losing either. And unfortunately, if we walk into any gym and see those people on the Stairmaster where they're sweating and their face is showing the fatigue or people running around the park, mm -hmm. most exercisers are going kind of hard too frequently and they're just blowing out their hormones, they're blowing out their joints, they're not getting fit, they're just getting, uh, you know, I guess they're getting, you know, cardiovascularly fit at the expense of their health. Because it seems like you're doing just fine. You, you don't, you're not on CRT, right? Not at all. No, I, I've never seems taken like you're doing anything. Just fine. Um, I'm totally open to the idea, and I think I probably should be more open. Why would utilizing a performance enhancing drug, for you, why would there be a moral dilemma or hang up for it? Uh, we, we have never seen um, an athlete training at that level and eating with that level of strictness and purity. And right and now, so you put those together. Liver King, yeah, I'm right? talking about Liver King. Liver King's going on a five day fast every quarter, preceded by a failed hunt, he calls it, which is an extreme glycogen depleting workout. I don't think any athlete has ever pushed it to that level. And that's how you're going to get veins and complete shredded year round. I mean, it's just, let's have a bunch of other people try that. They're going to look like Liver King with fasting and keto and you get good at fasting and you get fat adapted and you get keto adapted and I'm never hungry and I'm alert and energized and I'm more productive at work. That's because you're under fight or flight mechanisms, man. That's why it's happening. I think one thing that's interesting is that somebody that is unhealthy and very overweight, what I've noticed is that they got to get themselves to a healthy point before they can start to really lose weight. Yeah. yeah. he's In my book, he's fasting. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Got to fuel up for the next podcast. Anything that's under, right. anything that's on, like any meal that's under like 2,500 calories, it's a fast. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Does this break a fast? Does that break a fast? Yeah. Four <laughs> eggs and a steak. No, that's fine. Yeah. I had salt in my water. Is that breaking a fast? Yeah. 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 We it's got calories. Pat Project family, how's it going? You guys probably have watched a lot of Mark's lifting videos and some of my lifting videos, and you've probably noticed that our shorts never go past our knees. Nope. There's a reason for that. Y'all got to show those quads off, baby. <laughs> and the shorts that we're always wearing are from a company called Viori. That's called V-U-O-R-I. But Viori has amazing clothes for the gym that we wear, but also outside the gym. So you can wear them to dinner parties, dates, uh, you know, gather gatherings, all that good stuff. But all their clothes fit well, like fit amazing. This is a shirt from Viori, by the way. Look at that shoulder. <laughs> like, it's a two <laughs> just, just look at this. Look at the, it, it fits so well. For people in fitness um and even if you're not just check them out andrew how did they mm -hmm. get it? yeah clothes that look good inside and outside of the gym and work just as well inside and outside of the gym head over to viori.com slash power project that's v-u-o-r-i.com slash power project to receive 20 percent off your first order uh links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes sure i was and um i agree <laughs> that was really fast i mean it's amazing when you're you know, four nineteen. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, when when you're school. when you're in training, you're thinking like, geez, how can I get down to you know four fifteen? And you know now it's like, shit, how do I do that? You know what's fucking stupid about running? <laughs> All of it. I mean, what? Yeah, every, everything. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Bash Running Podcast. This is uh, one ex runner and two frustrated runners. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, what's dumb about it is that nobody ever talks about how how fast you're running, like. They have all these other ways of saying it, but like, we're here in the United States. Can't you tell me how many fucking miles an hour you went? Mm. Nobody ever talks about it. I don't even know how you like measure it or see it, but like, yeah. you know, running a, a 419 mile when you're in high school, it's like, it'd be kind of cool now how fast you run. I mean, I imagine you're running like 12 miles an hour or something like that, oh, but I don't know. It would take some calculations and right. they have it on TV during the world championship track and oh. field. They had the, the, the current miles per hour That's of everybody. And see. In, it was really that makes cool. the most sense to me. Yeah, mm -hmm. But what about on your watch? Like how, how many miles per hour am I yeah. going? It's always mm -hmm. pace per mile that shows right on the watch. I'm going 907 right now. I'm speeding up to 840. That's not good whatever, enough for me. I don't even know what that means. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't you know, care. You know, 10 miles an hour, six minute miles. 
That's mm-hmm. 60 minutes. Okay, right. so we know if we're running six-minute miles, we're going 10. Yeah. I know Usain Bolt goes 27.8 or something at his highest highest speed a human's ever gone, mm. running at 9.500 meters. Is it, though? Well, I, I would fairly, <laughs> I, I, I'm I actually, fairly certain that... I actually doubt yeah. it. You mm. think that's true? Yeah. You know, I had this uh, class at UC oh, Santa like, Barbara. He, he was the only guy measured, right? But I bet you there was yeah. some dude somewhere along the lines at some point that ran faster. No way. Some motherfucker that ran from a goddamn cheetah or something? You don't think he ran 31 <laughs> miles an hour? He's to, dead. To stay alive? <laughs> he didn't he make it. He's dead. He's dead. He ran 20 miles an hour and blew out his hamstring. Uh, <laughs> he had a brief glimpse of fame and then the cheetah got, cheetah got him. Yeah. Well, I had this class at UC Santa Barbara, <laughs> Professor David Young. He was like the world's leading expert on the ancient Greek Olympics. And he had this radical um, premise that he thinks those guys were very nearly as good as today's athlete, which mm. no one would think it would seem ridiculous that these ancient Olympians were anywhere near Usain Bolt. But he said um, the ancient Olympics ran for 800 years. Mm. And these guys who won were celebrated as the, the greatest victors in society in their village or their region. And so they were essentially professionals. And so he, he destroys this amateur myth of the modern Olympics too mm. with his, his body of work. And so these guys trained full-time they were fed grapes and, and steak and the best food by their servants, and they went to the, the baths, and they took care of their bodies, mm-hmm. and they ran things like the 200 meters and the long jump, and there's no way to compare their performance, but um, he, you know, he, he studied this and said, you know, if you do something for 800 years, <laughs> like, okay, we've been in modern Olympics for 120-something years, and these guys are pretty good. Usain Bolt's, I'm going to say, the fastest guy who's ever run on the planet. Um, but it would be interesting to think of these ancient dudes going out there and like the wrestlers, you know, they had sports mm-hmm. like that. Pancration. These, yeah, pancration where you had to, um, the, the secret way that you gave up was you had to tap. And um, it was, uh, Milo was undefeated. He's the greatest ancient Greek athlete. He was, he, he couldn't, never lost in the wrestling. Mm-hmm. And he was the guy who got strong by lifting up the calf. You know that legend? Yep. Like he had a baby calf and he lifted it up every day. <laughs> he invented until, uh, like yeah. periodization or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. Periodization, just <laughs> every day lifted up till it's 500 pounds is no problem. Same thing you do in every day. Mm. Milo of Croton, yeah. Wow. How was that chocolate in Tima? That shit was... Kind of spicy. I let it melt on my tongue. Right, okay, man. so by the way, you're getting spiced out. You want to give this a whirl? Yeah, yeah. you can either oh, take that square or take another square <laughs> oh, I'll take from this here. Little square right here. So this is that's Lily Bell Farms in Central Point, Oregon. I, I did a personal visit there on why route you, to. Why are you so low me? class, man? <laughs> He's super <laughs> low rank. What are you doing? Chew? You're supposed to let it melt oh, on mercy. your tongue so all the flavors can envelop your I'm mouth. Trying to get cavities. <laughs> 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 I never knew that until you just told me I'm it's, supposed to eat um, chocolate like wine. Chocolate connoisseurs, right? I, I can't be a wine snob. I don't drink, so I'm a full chocolate connoisseur. And I did learn from the experts. You can let that thing. You let that thing soak in. What happened? Yeah. Then you get the the terrier or what, the terroir, what whatever it's called. Uh, you can taste the fruity <laughs> after overtones and mm. things like that. Or as Whoa, Steve Carell said, the oaky afterbirth when he was drinking wine on the office. <laughs> what uh, what happened where you <laughs> What happened where you can't drink? Does oh, something happen? Um, no, people ask me that. Like, why don't you drink? And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I should start. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, as we're going to get into in this podcast, everything's open season now. I'm, I'm in a spicy mood with that spicy chocolate. And I'm, I'm rethinking a lot of things. And Spicy. This uh, start, spicy yeah. chocolate reminds me of when I had my football coach change from... Uh, it's hard to talk with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I had my football Spicing coach uh, change from doing dip every day. He's like, my wife tells me I need to get off this shit. I was like, Coach, no problem. I got you. I'll bring you fireballs tomorrow. That's the best way to get off that stuff. Mm. He's like, it is? The next day, he's like choking and coughing. and What the heck's fireballs? Yelling at me. Alcohol? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Candy. Oh, Oh, candy. Candy candy fireballs. Mm -hmm. Uh, It fucked him up. There's like super spicy jawbreakers as well as fireballs. Especially in the middle of summer. Mm -hmm. He's like choking. He went down to one knee. He's spitting. (laughs) <laughs> and it's all red <laughs> yeah. so other people think it's blood oh, he's like no. god damn it bell he's like get me some water <laughs> <laughs> i can't remember this. but he stopped him from dipping yeah at least for that well, day. it worked yeah so wait so it stopped him from dipping perpetually or yeah. just really yeah. <laughs> that's a weird he's why did like, you why he, did you think that though like I that doesn't just, make any sense i was just bullshitting <laughs> <laughs> i made he it just, up he just wanted his coach to have to just deal with the fucking yeah the uh the spicy candy 
Or yeah, the next day he was doing it again. We we're all laughing. We're like, I can't believe he's doing that shit. Why, <laughs> why is he believing in me? What's going on here? Dipping is some nasty shit. I remember mm. there's a uh, something like there's some dipping going on, and I went for a bottle that I was about to. Oh. I thought I was about to drink some water. I went like this, and I saw that shit. Uh, at the, I was like, yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, I almost drank someone's dip uh, sauce <laughs> from uh, their mouth. Oh, uh, it gives me the chills. Fucking nasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's brutal. So four nineteen mile in high school. That's going back a long time now. I, I can't even imagine it. You know, it's like when you're in training, you're just thinking about how can I get down to, you know, the elite uh, 412 or 415 or whatever. Um, but once was that know, like nationally you, ranked and stuff? Uh, I was ninth in California state finals, which was a good achievement because this is a lot of great runners here. And I was uh, 12th in national junior Olympics when I was a little guy, uh, a 16 year old division. How the wow. fuck fast yeah. are people running? That sounds really fast to me. Yeah. yeah. Like you be well, like I mean, um, champion. now, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, obsessed with this guy, Jakob Ingebrigtsen from Norway. He's the greatest middle distance runner in the world. He just crushed at world championships in Eugene. I saw for myself and he won the Olympic gold last year at age 20 in the 1500. Wow. And he's been going hard since he was like 10 years old. There's a reality show you can watch that it's been filmed over several years. So you see this 13-year-old kid being interviewed saying, uh, Jakob wants to be the greatest in the world and uh, I want to beat my brother. His, his brothers, two older brothers were both world-class and yeah. European champions. And here's this kid just training, looking up, looking up to his older brothers and all of a sudden breaking through. When he was 16, he ran a 356 mile, the, the youngest person ever to break four minutes in the mile. Wow. And he's just continuing to progress with this amazing career. And his training methods are uh, really um, novel and super interesting. What's he doing? Well, uh, you know, like you have this uh, sense of what a distance runner does and they go out and run 100 miles a week and they're always running and they, they run long on Sundays and mm -hmm. even the best milers, which is a pretty short event, they're universally running over 100 miles a week. Mm -hmm. They're working hard on the track. They're doing their long runs. They're doing their hill repeats. And what him and his brothers do, they're trained by their father who was completely unschooled in athletics. He just studied. He was like a you know regular guy, engineer and studied from all the greats and put together these pro this programming. And um, Jakob's older brother, Henrik, is 10 years older than him, so he was the first to kind of, you know, just um, immerse into this unique training. Uh, but they run right near anaerobic threshold all the time almost. And so they're running these, what you would call hard workouts, often twice a day. But it's right at this, uh, this pace, the threshold is the term, mm -hmm. and that means it's right before you would plunge into lactate accumulation, which would make your muscles burning and you'd have to stop. And then yeah. that's a, what a lot of runners do on their hard day. Hey, we're going to the track today. We're going to work hard. We're going to do quarters. We're going to do repeats and your muscles are burning and you're gasping for air. And then you have to recover for three days of jogging. And so instead, like they've thrown out a lot of the easy stuff, but they never exceed this capacity in training. So there's a New York Times article we can put in the link about Jakob and his training. He never goes over 87% capability in training. Now that's pretty fast for the world's leading guy and the gold medalist, but for him, he's like, you know, uh, running at this threshold pace, which is below his capacity, but he's maybe working it twice a day. And yeah, he just, he goes to the front and leads and just, you know, dares everybody to keep up with this machine-like uh, stride and a strategy, you know, he's not like sitting and waiting to the end to kick because you, he, he talks in interviews like, well, I'm the best runner, so I don't want to leave it to chance. I'm just going to work the hell out of these guys. And uh, yeah, that's the golden mile at his home, his home country of Norway. He's a national hero and his brothers. And I love that face where he's just, if you're uh, watching on YouTube, his face is calm. His stride is not tense. Mm. And so it looks like, hey, why don't you try harder in the home stretch to go faster? But that's as fast as as fast as you can allow the body to go by remaining uh, tension free right wait 346 was that a was that's that a mile a, yeah but was that a record because i'm looking at the it should be Let's no the great uh, el guru still has the world record in the mile of 343 from 1997 or 98 and he's says, the greatest uh, middle distance runner of all time but um and i thought this <coughs> el guru's record would never be broken in my lifetime maybe my kid's lifetime but he's got a shot here yaka because he's only 21 years old and mm. to think that he could take down El Garouge is, um, for, for running fans, it's like this guy was, you know, the greatest legend. His, his records have held for 25 years. It's I, pretty impressive. I may be tripping, by the way, but you said 1,500. Isn't 1,600 a mile? 
Or is a, it, is a mile is 1609 meters. 1609. And so when they have a mile race, just for the fascination of the crowd, and you know, people still have a high regard for the mile from old school, but in mm-hmm. international track today, it's the 1500 is the big event. That's the middle distance signature event. Mm-hmm. And this is a rare occasion where they run a mile race uh, just for the heck of it. Ah, uh, so, okay, okay. And, and even in uh, America, like in high school, the, the guys do 1600 meters, the, yeah. um, the, the high school runners, which is nine meters short of a mile. It's not even a mile, but it's four laps around a track because mm. tracks are 400 meters. We've gone mm. mostly to metric and then we still have this, you know, leftover dangling. I don't know if they have that in weights, like mm-hmm. everything's in kilos except for the mm-hmm. powerlifting Western championship meet in pounds, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what, when he trains, any idea like uh, how far he's going? Like how long is he holding on to this like 87%? Because in... It's very common for lifters to lift that way. Right, uh, right. But when you lift, you know, it's like it's over pretty quickly. You do doubles and triples yeah. and singles and stuff like well, that. Well, I mean, lifters are smarter than distance runners. I've known that for a long time since I worked in sports nutrition years ago where, you know, the the bodybuilder knows how to get a big bicep. Right. They, they work the heck out of themselves and they rest and recover. And meanwhile, the distance runners and the triathletes are just overtraining every day and not, not developing. So, um Interestingly, like he rarely runs over one hour in duration of his workout, Mm -hmm. which is also a fascinating uh, breakthrough because you've heard this on Huberman talking about where that makes sense. He only runs for four minutes, right? Well, I mean, he's also the world champion uh, at five thousand meters, which is a thirteen-minute event, which is pure. I mean, that's a real distance event, and he could probably crush ten thousand, which is even you know. Um, but have, rarely running over an hour is extremely rare because these guys are universally going out and doing their two and a half, two mm. hour runs, jogging though. So these guys are working hard or they're uh, resting and uh, not studying. He had a famous quote in that uh, interview where he was trying to bring his books to training camp and study in between workouts and he realized the books were tiring him out for his next workout. <laughs> mm. So now we're talking about the highest level of sophistication of a training athlete where he can't even study <laughs> between his workouts and look at that training graphic that Andrew's pulling up. Yeah, so if you look at something like 20 times 400 at 63, 64, that is you know, a pretty insane workout. But let's not forget, he's 328, 1500 meter guy. So for him, that's within his capability. And I think mm-hmm. that's the most important takeaway is that everything on that list, they're showing his training Monday through Saturday, Sunday, if you're just listening, um, it's, it's all hardcore training but it's not out there for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. So he's not overproducing the stress hormones in a chronic manner. He's just hitting a hard workout, but again, not too hard for him. It's within his his grasp. Um, And what's also amazing is like, he hasn't missed a a planned workout since he was like 11 or something. (laughs) So um, I love the, uh, it says 20 times 200 meter uphill times two. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. So that's, you know, 40 quick hits up the hill. But if, if you aspiring distance runners are looking at this, what we want to do is extrapolate everything down to our level of capability. So if I'm looking at this, I'm going to do one set of 10 times 200 meters up the hill, a quarter of what he's doing, because yeah. I'm not the world champion. And, um, you know, same with high school runners who are trying to get good. And when I was in high school, I, we, we got pretty good. We trained super hard, but we destroyed ourselves. And I, you know, I'd wake up Saturday morning. I couldn't even walk. I could barely, you know, get my calves going into the kitchen because everything was beyond our capability to yeah. the point where we're, we're just like getting into this competitive, ego-driven, um, let's see who can crush each other mindset rather than, hey, I'm building, building, building. And his father was building him since he was 11 or 12 or 13. You go on the reality show and there's these nice interviews, you know, and, and the father says, are you sure you want to do this? And Jakob says, yes, I, I'm, I want to do this. I want to be the best. I want to beat my brothers. And I also want to be the best in the world. The, the dad's like, okay, then, well, here we go. You know, we're off and running. And, um, do you know how his brothers do? Like, are, do his brothers compete also? Or? Yeah, Henrik, the oldest, is European champion, one of the Ooh. fastest 1,500 meter runners of all time, fifth in the Olympics in London 2012, 10 years ago. Um, Philip was, uh, succeeded him as European champion and also highest level of the world, you know, 330 personal best. So those three guys from one family in Norway are among the best runners of all time. And Jakob is on his way to, you know, he, he's, he's like a once in a lifetime talent. Did their dad do anything notable as a runner or was no, he just he was a great an engineer coach? dude. Engineer. And he, he, didn't, <laughs> engineer. he didn't have any sporting background. Like yeah. he, he wasn't, he didn't have that bias, which is an interesting, um, you know, like 
if dad was a great runner back in uh, with with mm-hmm. Lossy Viren, uh, you know, in the old days, maybe he'd come into it with the traditional bias, like the old baseball manager, where the pitcher has to only throw eighty pitches and then stick his mm-hmm. elbow in a bucket of ice, you know. Uh, well, it probably sounds fair to say, like that he just basically just doesn't really train running very slowly. Right. Yeah. Like almost, it doesn't appear like he. I mean, who the, who knows? You know, you, you can't see all of his training through YouTube, but most of the stuff we're watching is like he's moving pretty goddamn fast. Yeah, and it's pretty open book. I mean, the reality show cameras have been on him for a decade, and you know, you can now they're they're glad to publish you know his methods, and it's sort of like, hey, here's what I'm doing. Why don't you try it and, and try to catch me? Because it's a pretty stunning commitment to being an athlete and, and not being able to study in between workouts, mm-hmm. I think is just so awesome. <laughs> one like, of the one of the big knocks sometimes on the endurance athletes is that they're not very strong, right? And so he's still maintain whether I don't know how much he lifts and stuff like that, but like he's maintaining a level of strength by going at these intensities and doing things like hill training and stuff like that. Yeah, and it seems like, you know, it's very sport specific. So um, he would probably get his butt kicked in most uh, general CrossFit games type of uh, mm-hmm. approach, but uh, they don't care either. And it's also interesting because, you know, we talk a lot about cross training and the triathletes, you get fit and because you're swimming, biking and running. And so you're so fit and your biking translates over to your running. Uh, but these guys, like if they're off their feet from an injury or something, it sets them back tremendously. Even if they're riding that bicycle like crazy every day and doing uh, the sprints on the bike or running, you know, you run in the swimming pool in a, in a flotation vest Hard and to go through the stride. Yeah, there's just no way to get good at middle distance running besides running those middle distance workouts that we saw on the screen. And um, to compare him with Kipchoge, the marathoner that's 159, oh. the greatest marathoner of all time, um, he runs rarely over 80%. Mm of his capacity because he's a marathoner, right? So it's a whole different, he's training for a two hour event rather than a three minute and 28 second event. But he sort of has that same philosophy of where he's just working up near his uh, threshold all the time and not needing to go and jog or rest or deal with, you know, breakdown and injuries and soreness and things that, you know, even recreational runners deal with, let alone, you know, competitors. A lot of the U.S. guys, some of the most famous guys bombed out this year. They didn't even make the U.S. team to go to Worlds because they were uh, performing poorly for whatever reason, injuries or overtraining, I'm going to say. Yeah. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Being a runner for sport is just so interesting. Like, even doing these longer distances as far as your training is concerned, because, yeah, maybe they do some stuff in the weight room, but the just repetitious aspect, you know, like, yeah, maybe you can go outside, get views, but maybe you're on a track and you're just going and going and going. And I just think about just the mental aspect of that, because when you think of, like, lifting or martial arts or any of those, at least there's some type of variability yeah. right yeah. but when it comes to these long distance running and the training it i'm trying to think of something that could be more grueling and just more just mentally taxing because it's just same 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 yeah, yeah. you know it, it's just damn they, being they're, in, they're being going in a, at it being in a pool that's what people Ooh, have said is yeah. brutal yeah people yeah. have said the pool is tough you just look at the fucking bottom of the pool and yeah. you can't even mm-hmm. like Unless you're my wife and you've been training for a long time, you can't talk in between your sets. Mm-mm. You know, she has it all strategically planned out so she can gossip in between <laughs> her sets and stuff. But yeah, rest intervals. Yeah, it's really difficult. Yeah. But you said something interesting earlier. We were talking about like being social versus being like mm. the greatest. And mm-hmm. for a lot of people that aren't, um, for a lot of people that maybe find out that they, um, or for a lot of people that are struggling to get to where they want to be, they recognize at some point they can't really be that social, right? Well, yeah, if you want to be a serious competitor, I was saying like back in the old days in triathlon, I would plan these long rides. We're going to go climb in the Sierras. It's this great route. I'm inviting you to my house to start there on Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. And um, I'd head out there to a planned seven-hour ride, and we'd get to the hour and 20-minute checkpoint to get water. And I'd tell my buddies like, guys, I'm not feeling it today. My legs aren't there. I'm turning around, going home, going to sleep. Here's the map. Enjoy yourself. And, you know, it was kind of like... It takes a lot of courage to get to this point where you're going to put your long-term best interests and your competitive goals in front of being 
perfect attendance award. I get a t-shirt at my CrossFit box because I made every workout this week. It's like, if that's what you're going for, that's fine. And if it's mainly a social outlet and you're there because you want to do the, uh, the, the the run to feed the hungry every year and, and you're going you know, to practice with your friends and um, it's not this perfectly aligned, serious thing, that's fine too. But like, we got to get clear with our goals and say, you know, if I want to be serious here, just like the father talking to young Jacob was like, do you understand what this takes if you want to be the best in the world? And the kid's like, hell yeah, I'm going to kick my brother's ass and kick everyone else's ass. You know, he was ready for it. And it's, you, you can't judge either approach, but do not get intermixed there where you're trying to be sort of social and sort of go for that perfect attendance award, but also you harbor these competitive goals and you're spouting these great, you know, aphorisms like, uh, I intend to, you know, uh, be the, uh, you know, be, be the best I can be. Well, then go to sleep and, and <laughs> instead of show up at 4 a.m., uh, what's the guy's name that your buddy that comes in? Uh, which one? Josh. Josh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's like, that's great, but one of those days is not going to be right for you, the individual. So you got to hit that snooze alarm and don't mm. feel like a wuss and there, you're going to get shit because you didn't show up. It's like you're locked into, you know, your, your intuition and your best long-term decisions. And that was, that was hard for me because um, part of it was like, hey, here's a race. They're inviting me to fly to this Caribbean island for free and uh, get an appearance fee and I can uh, go and pick up some more money and I'm a professional, so that's what I'm all about. But it's like, is this in my long-term best interest when I'm pointing for the world championships four months from from then? Because I got to deal with jet lag, a hot environment, a hard race, jet lag coming back. And so you have to make all kinds of different sacrifices if if you intend to you know go for your ultimate potential. I remember when I was lifting, there would be... Uh, People would talk about all kinds of different ways of lifting. Some people would squat three times a week. Some people would bench three times a week or deadlift three times a week. Or some people would bench, squat, and deadlift on the same day. Mm -hmm. There's all these different uh, ways of lifting. And I remember um, I remember Ed Cohn saying like he felt like the people that were the most worried about it were the people that wanted to do it more than once a week. <laughs> And, you know, he's the greatest of all time. You know, he deadlifted 900 pounds at 220. And it's just a really good point of like, you can train it multiple times a week, but if you just put in a really hard, good effort, you can also train it differently than that. Mm -hmm. And there's even been guys in powerlifting, powerlifting years and years ago, there was guys that would uh, do a heavy lift every other week. You know, so it's like, it's crazy. Like what you, even even, uh, Eric Lillibridge more recently, him and his dad and his brother, they all train that way. They would only uh, do a heavy squat or a heavy deadlift uh, every other week. And they did, did that for years on end. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's amazing like what your body can do and how your body can kind of adjust to certain uh, things. But in powerlifting specifically, lifters have been pretty in tune with the fact that lift doing stuff at 100% is not a great idea. Mm-hmm. And spending too much time in the gym is not a great idea. And for people to really make progress, they they most often have to kind of be in that percentage range that you're talking about this guy being in, kind of that uh, somewhere between 75 and maybe almost 90%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's greasing the groove or whatever you want to call it to become pretty popular. And then I think when you go to execute it, at least I'm speaking for myself, it's pretty difficult. Like I, I'll go to the track to do a set of 200s knowing that my, my goal time by calculation is 36 seconds, which is, it's not that hard for me. I'm used to going 30, 31. And so I'll be like, I, I can't train that way anymore. It's too difficult, too stressful. I get sore after. So I'm going to slow down to 36 and I cross the line and it says 34. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> I have to work harder to, to be focused on the purpose of the workout. And there's some good uh, clips in, the, in that Ingebrigtsen show where the dad's yelling at them for coming in a second too fast on their repeat, because again, that anaerobic threshold physiologically is a huge difference between exceeding that lactate buildup in the blood versus staying right there in that beautiful sweet spot. Um, it's four millimolars per uh, kilogram. And so they can finish the effort, the uphill thing, prick their finger really fast and see what their blood lactate is in real time I was ask out you, there how are on they the course. Tracking it? So yeah. that's how they're tracking it? Yeah. Are and they I mean, using a wearable of any kind? Uh, you, you just go and prick your finger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And of course they have their heart rate. Yeah. And so then you get competent knowing that 173 is about my anaerobic threshold. And I don't want to get it over that. Mm-hmm. But to get even more accurate is prick your finger. The Tour de France guy has been doing that a long time. And um, there's good content in... Um, was it Tyler Hamilton's book, The Secret Race, where he talks about all the doping and how they, how they got away with it. It's pretty fascinating. Oh, but also they had a calculation of 
um, number of watts at anaerobic threshold per kilogram of body weight. And there's this calculation. And if you're at the right number, you have a chance to win the tour. And if you're not, you're not going to win the tour. You're going to be the working person that hands the water bottle to the favorite guy. <laughs> and it's like if you're over 6.8 or 7.1 or something, um, you are known that when you get to the mountains yeah. where the body weight ha matters so much because on flat ground, anybody can win. They go for five hours and some guy sprints and then mm -hmm. the specialists win because they can sprint the last 100 meters. But when you get to that mountain, then it's how many watts, right? How much power can you put out on that bike per your body weight? Because if a light guy is doing, if you you can put out 500 watts on your Aerodyne mm -hmm. bike, so can I, let's say, mm -hmm. but I weigh this many pounds less than you, I'm going to toast you on a hill. And so that's the whole tour comes down to this mathematical equation that they can go and figure out in June when they're training, they're going to climb up a steep hill, they're going to prick their finger and the coach is going to mm -hmm. go, you're going to win, you're going to work for him because he's better than you. And it's, it's pretty wild how, um, now how do you get to 7.3? Uh, you know, wattage per kilogram, you're doping your ass off and you're taking the red blood cell product EPO because how can you train that hard to put out that many watts when you only weigh 140 pounds? So mm -hmm. that's the other factor that comes into, mm -hmm. um, you could probably even predict like this guy's doped if he's at 7.3 because 6.8 is the most any human could ever get to in terms of ability when they're, when they're not full of EPO and their hematocrit's not too high. You know, I don't pay much attention to cycling. I still don't pay any attention to cycling. But since Lance Armstrong, has there been anybody who has been able to, I don't know, match his skill? Like, yeah, good question. Then? I mean, and also skill. What does that mean? And to uh, me, when I when I look at Lance, like he was the most prepared and the most mentally optimal athlete I think that we've ever seen. Mm. And um, it was just amazing how he lived his life, how he organized the the operation. You know, U.S. Postal Bicycling Team had 40 employees. 20 of them were riders, 20 of them were therapist, coach, manager, whatever. And he was pretty much ruled that environment and, and orchestrated everything with his sidekick, Brunil, who was the team director. And so they'd pick the right athletes and they'd assess who was up and coming and get that guy on their team because they needed him to work for him in the mountains. Yeah. So it was like a business. And then he was training his body as an athlete. And he had, you know, the highest level of confidence. But I wrote a book about him. It's called How Lance Does It. I was, um, I interacted with him a lot when we were triathletes back when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And he just had this, the, the most ideal competitive mindset I've ever seen. And it was just this complete confidence, you know, cockiness like everyone accuses him of. But it was mainly like confidence in his own abilities and his ability to stay focused and work hard. And also like complete fearlessness of not only winning, but fearless, if not fearing losing either, yeah. which is an important distinction because I think a lot of athletes, they're afraid of winning and breaking through because then they don't have that struggle that they're so familiar with. And some of them have talked about this in public. And I think we see like the mental aspects where the mental health is now a big factor in, in sports. And I, I think it's all great to have this come out, but a lot of athletes are afraid of being the best. And then there's a ton of them that are afraid of losing mm -hmm. and therefore playing conservatively. And in the fourth quarter, the Warriors are up by 18, but they start to get stiff and Curry's not flipping his shots anymore. Yeah. Um, Dr. Uh, what's his name? Dr. Lore, he's written a bunch of mental training books. He says Curry <laughs> is the best ideal athlete mindset he's ever seen because he's constantly loosey-goosey, relaxed, having fun, sticking yeah. his tongue out, wagging his tongue, flipping a shot because your shot when you're 27 feet away, you can't have any tension or forcing mm -hmm. the shot. He's flipping his shot up like he's playing on the playground. And that's mm -hmm. how the best basketball player ever, I think in many ways, he's the best. Uh, but Lance was like that in cycling to answer your question. So he had all those attributes that were beyond anything we've ever seen. Yeah. And because the sport was so dirty and so doped, he would win the tour by two minutes or three minutes or seven minutes. But if it was clean, he would have won by 20 minutes or 30 <laughs> minutes. I don't think enough people say that or appreciate that. It's like he was a victim of the genetically inferior athlete taking a shortcut to catch up to what he was naturally. Yeah. And of course he was 6% better because everybody was doped. And so it, it, it closes the gap just like in uh, the, the, the locker room of the NFL uh -huh. or, or high school. 
yeah. go to Grant High Powerhouse or whatever, mm-hmm. three of those guys look like you. <laughs> they're 17 and they're, they're going to D1. They're getting a full ride yeah. and they're doing an NIL deal. Uh, like uh, the, the quarterback, uh, Nicholas, Tennessee, is getting $7 million to throw balls. He's in Ooh. 10th grade. He's going into 11th grade. The greatest NIL deal. Anyway, there's these genetic freaks mm-hmm. that have the attributes and then all the all the drugs can come into play to help them get higher, especially the red blood cell drug, because um, if you're you know oxygenating your blood that high, you're going to make a huge bump, and you're going to get as good as the you know the best the best natural guy, I guess. Mm-hmm. Now, I haven't followed the sport that much. I just love the Lance era and watching all that, and it was so great. And I kind of got <laughs> disappointed when all this stuff blew up. Um, but apparently. They're still climbing the, the key mountains like Alpe d'Huez. They have these signature climbs, the Tourmalet, that they go on most every year. It's a mm-hmm. famous mountain pass. It's like going over the Sierras. You know, who can ride up Donner Pass in an hour or whatever? Mm-hmm. Um, they're still climbing like in similar times to what Lance threw down in the era of, you know, rampant doping and, and drug use. Damn. And so I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to, I mean, I, don't, I can speculate, I guess, on this show. We have no limits, right? It's like, okay, well, you're not going to beat Lance clean because Lance was doped and he was better than you because he's the most genetically, you know, gifted endurance athlete we've ever seen. He was 15 years old. He was racing against me and the others on the pro triathlon circuit, 15, 16 years old. Yeah. I guarantee you he wasn't doped at 15 or 16 years old. So he was an incredible <laughs> endurance machine, the likes of which we've never seen. And then of course he got ushered into the, the doping era, but, um, yeah, I don't know what's going on these guys now, but in Tyler Hamilton's book, The Secret Race, he's talking about microdosing with EPO where you just take a little pinch every night or something uh, into, the, uh, into the skin mm-hmm. to help boost your red blood cells. And by morning, you will test clean because it's a, 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 you know, a, a small dose rather yeah. than a big dose where you're going to get busted. And he calls it like your radioactive period. You don't want to get tested by a surprise unannounced drug test visitor during that time. And so he has passages in the book where, you know, he and his wife are making dinner in the kitchen, the doorbell rings, they hit the deck and freeze for 30 minutes and don't move and don't talk. And the doorbell rings again, doorbell rings again. And then the person writes down, you know, failed attempt, I'll be back at 6 a.m. And if you miss that one, you're suspended. And so it was just funny. Like, and he, he'd, he'd finish his bike ride and he'd always cut through like the neighbor's yard, lift his bike over the fence, sneak through his own backyard, into the <laughs> oh basement, up the God. stairs, and then into the kitchen in case someone was at the door waiting for him. Whew. Yeah, it was, it was a heavy read, put it that way. Can you uh, tell us about um, Lance Armstrong's gardener? Do you know that story? No. <laughs> Lance Armstrong's uh, gardener went with him on the Tour de France uh, tours. And he would stop at like a local bar or whatever. And Lance would meet him there and he would have like, he would like blood dope him like right there on the spot. Like give him whatever oh, I, EPO or whatever drugs he I had. I think his nickname was Moto Man. Moto Man. That's I didn't what they know it was his gardener, yeah, but it was Moto gardener. Man. Yeah, they called him yeah. Moto Man. Yeah, he would, he would cruise around on a little uh, moped. That's why they called him Moto Man. And he had all these like drugs for him or whatever. And then in that uh, documentary that they did, they had like, they, it was funny because they were, they were, really suspicious of the U.S. team, and they're like, we don't really know what's going on. We can't just go and accuse him. <laughs> While they're talking outside of this uh, <laughs> mobile home unit that they had, that they were cruising around in, they're in there doping at that very moment. Like, they're in there, like, getting, like, these blood, I think, I don't know, blood transfusions or yeah, something they, like they that. they replaced their own blood that they took out six while they're weeks outside before. talking suspicious. about yeah how suspicious yeah. it is but they can't you know, like just like they can't go in like you know just bust them on stuff. how did they know that they were yeah. doing that at that moment in time though like what it's in the documentary i forget how it's That's shown sick. or explained or or maybe they just said hey in retrospect i think that it was happening mm-hmm. and maybe they just showed a clip of it or something like that what's it called yeah. i want to watch it do you know the name uh, of the, the dog? Armstrong Lie. The Armstrong right? Lie. Yeah, there's so many, man. I'm lo- losing That's count. It's incredible. It's all pretty, yeah. It's incredible. Uh, the one thing where you kind of like, where his story just loses me is like, and I don't even, I don't have any idea of his business or, or how any of it happened, but it appears that he like went out of his way to attack people. Yeah, yeah. That were yeah. that were throwing shade yeah. at him, but like. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was yeah. a business strategy. Um, I think it was. It he was, sued a guy for like two million dollars. Yeah, he sued million. sued everybody that yeah. spoke out, and like you know, there was some. It's just like a there. random writer who doesn't have that kind of dough. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And he and he won. Like Lance Armstrong <laughs> oh, won. God. Yeah, yeah. And there was people like tearful confessions, people coming forward saying, "I've seen it all. This is what happened. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling the truth to clear my own conscience." <laughs> and then they, and they would get their asses sued off by by the machine because once you're <laughs> stuck in that lie 
And he's done a pretty good job, uh, you know, these days coming forward and saying, look, you know, what, what am the I going to do? The greatest natty or not story of all time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. Like, yeah right. You know, wow. you're, you're stuck. It's like um, uh, Madoff or something. You're not going to, yeah. you're not going to go to the two thirds mark and go, Hey, sorry, I took all your guys money. I really, I really, I'll make it up to you. Please, you know, forgive me. It's, it's just blown up and it's gotten so big. And now he's a hero to the cancer survivor. So he's not going to let down the little bald children. And it just got, oh! really, you know, it got really heavy. But I think we, you know, the thing we have to appreciate when we point fingers and say that person's a cheater, mm -hmm. this person isn't, it's like, look, um, this is major big time sports. And we now know that everyone was dope that at, at the highest level of uh, especially cycling. And we can speculate all we want about the other things and um, liver king and all the rest, you know, but um, it doesn't, I think I'm going to say that the playing field is most likely level mm -hmm. wherever we're looking. Mm -hmm. So, is Usain Bolt, did he take dope when he was sprinting? Well, if he did, I guarantee you the other seven guys in the finals did, and that so he's sense. still the fastest. And, I would agree with that. Um, the ones that are deliberately cheating when they know they're in a clean sport, that's rough. And that was my era of triathlon, 86 to 94, where you know the doping was just kind of emanating into the endurance sports and people realizing that even if you take anabolic steroids, even as a skinny geek going and riding your bike up the hill, it's going to have a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. And I had to make this assumption, like I had to go to sleep at night and wake up in the morning, assuming that this sport was squeaky clean and these were my buddies. And I crashed with Mark Allen and Kenny Souza in Colorado, two of the best guys. And I go train with Mike Pig and Arcada, another top guy, and use his bathroom and borrow his toothpaste. And it's like, I know this sport is clean and everyone's working hard and we're all trying our best. Otherwise, I would... I'd have to quit. I know these guys. They go to church with me right. on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like this. You uh, raise hell and accuse everybody of doping, quit or join them. Those are your three choices and none of them are any good, right? Or fourth, uh, get your ass kicked and go home and uh, give a hug to your wife and say, I got seventh, but I was maybe the first clean person. So uh, oh, let's God. go celebrate with a pizza. None, hey. of the, none of those four are hey, good. But what about getting a PR? Well, I mean, um, if it's your profession, like I, I mean, I gave a up, faster yeah. a faster person will yeah. help you get a PR, right? I mean, here's does the that thing. not matter because mm -hmm. you don't get first? I mean, I, I gave up nine years of my life dedicated to the pro circuit, yeah, yeah. so I wasn't interested in PRs or moral mm. victories. Mm. And so, if I was becoming suspicious that I was in a doping sport, I was going to have this crossroads. Where but what if you win and you get your worst time ever? <laughs> it's okay. Win's a win. I don't care Everybody about Everybody else got injured. You got your worst yeah, time ever. I don't care. I don't, yeah. But I mean, it, win, it's, yeah, it's you know, win's a win. to think about it now, um, and then, you know, subsequently, a few guys got knocked off here and there that I raced against mm -hmm. that stole money out of my pocket mm. because they were doped and I wasn't. Um, and that one's pretty heavy. It, it all happened after I, pretty much after I quit. You say got knocked off. What do you mean? They got caught? They got busted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so there were people experimenting and trying to take a shortcut and get a break and beat people like me. Mm -hmm. And so that one, you know, that one gets me riled up. But compare that to the cyclists and Tyler Hamilton's story where one of the chapters is called A Thousand Days. And the reason it's called A Thousand Days, he goes, that's how long you last in Europe clean before you get smoked so bad that you're heading back home to the <laughs> farm. And in Europe, cycling's blue collar sports. So those guys are going back home to the factory and the foundry to pound out steel or whatever. It's not like, you know, they're falling back on their college degrees. And I guess I'll go, you know, I'll go get a marketing job and do some tech uh, <laughs> venturing. Yeah. No, they were win or die. And so um, it's very easy to cross over. And they said, you know, they, they took him aside, Tyler, and they said, you know, we saw your heart. We saw you fighting in last place in the pouring rain and not giving up. And you have a lot of potential and you have the heart of a champion. You just need to get your vitamins right. <laughs> and your so vitamins. go into, yeah, that was the euphemism. And so that was his ushered into the era of, you know, of you know, the, 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 the professionalism of the sport. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, he's, he's writing this thing like, do I tell my wife? And there's another guy, Frankie Andrea, one of the guys that ratted out Lance later. I have bad thoughts about that, his whole, how his whole thing went down, but mm -hmm. like his wife made him swear up and down. His fiance, do not do any of this doping shit that I've heard about. If you do, I'll divorce your ass and I'll never, oh, I promise, I promise, mm -hmm. I promise. So he's about to lose his job years later because he's just not quite that strong. He's fighting hard. He's a talented guy. 
And he got in his car one day and drove across the border to Switzerland where you walk into the, the, the pharmacy and you can buy some EPO. And he's like, oh uh, yeah, I need some EPO. And the guy's like, how much? He goes, one. You know, he goes, no, you need a hundred. Here's what you need. Take this, take that. And so he's, you know, off onto the dark side too and keeping his wife out of it for a while. But imagine like the pain and suffering of having a passion for sport like that and having to keep it secret. And then, you know, it, it was, it, it's pretty fascinating, but it, it's kind of a subject that's sensitive to me because I was that racer that dedicated my life to it and wanted to believe it was clean. But now I think I was probably, um, you know, naive in a way. And it's like, shit. You never took anything? Nothing, man. I'd never taken anything in my whole life. I didn't even take pain kills after my um, appendectomy. I had an emergency appendectomy. And it was pretty serious. You know, I almost died. I was bleeding yeah. out. And, um, you know, I, I told the guy in the hospital, like, no, I'm an athlete. I'm strong. I don't want any of that stuff. Leave me alone. <laughs> and he's like, well, if you ever need anything, push this button. And like a few <laughs> hours later, the anesthesia wears off and then the pain kicks in. Mm. I thought I was feeling fine. You know, but it was because I was still under a little bit. Mm. I was pushing that button so much. They like telling me to shut up because I wanted more drugs, more drugs, more drugs. It was just so, the pain was so overwhelming. But I, I have that starting point of like, I, even with like, um, you know, training, I don't even want caffeine. You offered me a caffeine generously, but it's like when I was tired as an athlete, I wanted to feel the full extent of my fatigue mm -hmm. so I could make the right training decision. I did not want to take a central nervous system stimulant, even though, of course, it's going to help me. Whatever else was probably going to help me. But I felt like somewhere down the road, I was going to pay for it because I was propping myself up. It's almost like you know, going in there and playing the heavy metal music is going to change your mood and change your state and change your neuro neurotransmitters. And maybe... I didn't need that today. Maybe yeah, you I had needed like it. entrance music today when you came <laughs> totally. in. Totally. Like right at the exact time. Thunderstruck <laughs> <Yeah>. came on <laughs> right when you walked in. It was yeah. unbelievable. But I mean, now it's, you know, I, I'm, like I said, I'm rethinking everything. Maybe that's one of the things I should rethink. I should just, you know, coffee up every time I work out so I can get a little, you know, a little boost and do something better. But I feel like. What um, about TRT? Because like now, it, you yeah. know, like, so you're going against other old geezers, right? So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. How old are you, by yeah, the way, Brad? 57, man. I'm, 57. I mean, it's. Uh, you know when they say age is just a number? Yeah. I think uh, someone <laughs> called bullshit on that. And I'm like, you know, that's a good point. Like, you better respect however many years you got because I'm not 27 yeah. and I need to be careful. I can't, you know, extend myself too hard. I need You're to know my well, limits. You're aging well, though, dude. Oh, thanks. You're well, aging really you know, well. I feel fitter now than when I was a triathlete in many ways. Yeah, healthier. Even though I was, you know, yeah. I was very fast to go straight ahead in a swim and a bike and a run, mm -hmm. but I couldn't lift a sandbag or, or do, mm. I couldn't even do my, my 10 pound, you know, back work. Like I, I couldn't do anything because I was just fragile and like a little greyhound. Yeah. <laughs> why yeah. do some people oh. like yourself, and I don't know if you say this about yourself, but why do some people like yourself uh, sometimes not consider themselves athletes? Because you, you've had a... a a really good athletic career. It sounds like you have uh, this running background. Uh, you have records in speed golf, and now you're doing high jump. Yeah, yeah. It sounds I'm, very athletic, but do do people do sometimes people in the endurance community just uh, I don't know maybe is endurance stuff not viewed as being athletic? In some I way? don't view it as. <laughs> maybe. Mm, yeah. Excuse me, all you endurance listeners. The four percent. What's that demographic report, Andrew? There it is. Four percent of listeners yeah. like endurance. Well, it's such a it's such a narrow focus, but when you get immersed in that for so long, I was an endurance athlete since high school to age 30 when I retired from triathlon. You kind of think like anyone that can like endure it can do it? Sort yeah. Of thing? It's that, like, okay. I thought I was a big, big badass athlete because I was a, a pro triathlete who could go fast in those three events, but I was a pathetic athlete. And I, I realized this, like coaching my, like I told on the last show, I said, I transitioned from triathlon and my next athletic goal is to dominate little kids in soccer, basketball, and track because I coached for 10 years and mm -hmm. I'd get out there on the soccer field and I was full on participatory coach. I had full gas on every time. I didn't <laughs> hold back on these poor little guys. So wreck those yeah. kids on the field. <laughs> but it's like, I wanted to get better at cutting and backpedaling and, you know, gaining all these different athletic skills. Yeah. Um, high jump, I love the event so much and it, it brought back now in my adult life to being like my main athletic focus now, but I was coaching it for the middle school kids. And so I said, hey, watch me do this. You know, I want to show you how you hit that curve hard and explode off the ground. And so these are things that you need to, you know, you need to pull out of the hat and the triathloning didn't help me. And so there's a lot of adults, like we kind of tend to, you know, plug into these athletic goals because of cultural and marketing forces saying, oh, you should do a half marathon because you need to get healthier and get your butt off the couch. Oh, okay, I guess I'll sign up and um, start running. 
but it's like that's like a little slice of the pie. It's a tiny sliver of mm-hmm. what fitness really means. And so maybe they should come in here on Saturday, Sunday, and see if they can lift something off the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, see if they can lift a PVC deadlift. Can you do it right? We have um, Primal Fitness Coach. We filmed this certification course, and we had the uh, the camera guy. He was the he was the video coordinator, and we needed a we needed a guy to do the deadlift and mm-hmm. demonstrate on camera teaching a novice a deadlift. Yeah. And we're like, okay, keep your back straight when you lift up this PVC off the ground, and every time. He hunched his back over. He could not keep his back straight. I'm going, no, no, no. Keep your back straight, man. This is the third try. I want to see you keep your back straight. Huh. Yeah, it, a lot it, of people don't know what that means. You couldn't even get the click going. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was fascinating because it's like um, we're so far removed from functional culture in so many ways. We can sit in a car, sit in a chair, sit in a subway, sit on the couch. We don't have the basic notion of, of human fitness. So I'm putting up high ranking on the list. Strength training, of course. Sprinting. Um, being able to explode and do something explosive is 97% of the communities completely disengaged from that. Yeah. But then we have 60,000 people shuffling along doing the New York City Marathon. It's better than being on the sideline, Absolutely. but it's sort of like, all right, now you can do that. Maybe not take it to such an extreme because it's not necessary. If you can run three miles nonstop without stopping, I think that's pretty fantastic. Yeah. And at a slow pace. Yeah, that's twenty. A, yeah, you can run twenty something minutes. That sounds that's pretty a good. Long ass way. Yeah. I mean, that's three miles downtown Sacramento for me. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a long run. Someone's mm-hmm. gonna have to pick you up. But mm-hmm. then, you know, when you go further down that road at the expense of just basic fitness competency, and I think that's what. Well, I mean, even even the elite athletes, they they have, of course are sacrificing that, and I sacrifice all that to be a triathlete. That's fine. But then you wake up and go on with the rest of your life. So it's like, yeah, I mean, high jumping is important. I think I should be able to jump off the ground and land safely and all that fun stuff, you know? I think also too, when it comes to like distance running, I don't think you have to run. I don't know shit from shit. Like I'm so new to running, but (laughs) I would say that I don't think that you have to really run that far to be a good distance runner. Oh my gosh. Um, The the research from uh, Dr. O'Keefe, he has a TED talk, uh, run for your life, but not too far and at a slow pace. Like Mm. there's research that the maximum cardiovascular benefits accrue with a very modest commitment to cardio, something to the tune of a couple few hours a week at a slow pace. And they talk about zone two. You hear people talk about that, Peter Atia. You got to work on your zone two for your longevity, which is zone two means really comfortably pace under that aerobic capacity. So you're, you can talk and you know pedal a bike or jog or jog walk or whatever it is. But it's like, you can go get an A plus in that, in that yeah. class just from walking after dinner uh, with your mate for 15, 20 minutes with your dog mm-hmm. every day or whatever. You can, yeah, we got to have more movement in life and, and more cardio from, from zero, but you can go from zero to A plus vastly more easily than any of the half marathon runners might, might understand, you know, because you're, you're, you know, like you're immersed in this culture, in this community thinking like, well, you know, I only did a two hour time. I want to do a one hour and 45 for my next half marathon. Okay, fine. But you know, it, it's already, um, way up there. And then where are your deficiencies? And that's where I think, you know, explosiveness, power, being able to running some 200s and 400s would yeah. probably be ideal yeah. for somebody trying to get faster at a marathon. Yeah, I mean, right? you know, this is, you know, Sisson uh, talked about this 15 years ago with the primal fitness of, you know, sprint once in a while, lift heavy things, and move around a lot. Those were the three primal laws that's honoring our ancestral past and how humans evolved. And, you know, uh, notably missing from the list is uh, steady state cardio at that in-between heart rate that's quote unquote kind of hard. That's a quote from Dave Scott, our, our legendary triathlete mm-hmm. from Dave. He goes, I don't want my athletes ever going kind of hard. You want to go slow and comfortable or you want to go explosive and build your sprint capacity. But that in-between place is where you get tired. And unfortunately, if we walk into any gym and see those people on the Stairmaster where they're sweating and their faces showing the fatigue or people running around the park, mm-hmm. most exercisers are going kind of hard too frequently and they're just blowing out their hormones, they're blowing out their joints, they're not getting fit, they're just getting, uh, you know, I guess they're getting you know, cardiovascularly fit at the expense of their health. Yeah. Yeah. You know, quick question, man. Um, Mark actually asked you about the TRT thing, and I'm curious because you're 57 now, right? Yeah. So you're 57. So um, is that something that you ever think you're going to do? Is it something that you, you think is necessary? Or because it seems like you're doing just fine and you don't, you're not on TRT, right? Not at all. No, I n- I've never seems taken like anything. Just fine. Um, the most I've ever taken was those pain pills when I was pushing the button mm-hmm. and Nurse Rudy was coming and giving me more morphine or whatever they were giving me. But, yeah. um, 
I'm totally open to the idea. And I think I probably should be more open because, um, you know, a lot of these notions, like my notion of living a pure and clean life, I think has served me pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I don't reach for prescription drugs for any reason. I don't even want to take antibiotics. I want to like wait till that foot's about to get, have to get cut off and then I'll, (laughs) then I'll go in. But, you know, I want to push it to the edge of what I can do with my own natural capabilities. And I test all the time my male hormones and I put up some good numbers. I had a thousand and eight uh, serum testosterone last year. Jesus. But I, but I range from 560 <laughs> that's really to 750 high. to 820 to 730 to a thousand and eight. No, to that's, that's amazing though. So I, I guess that's pretty good. That, but um, I mean, yeah, it's fine. Like no, I wouldn't that, be a that's, candidate. That's yeah. good though. But that, that, yeah. that just means there's aspect, like that's when I wonder, okay, I mean, uh, would TRT even make that much of a difference for somebody like you? And the, the, the cool thing about you, though, is that you have your, everything about your lifestyle is in check. A lot of people mm. that end up trying to do TRT, they don't sleep well. They're not active. They don't yeah. have good nutrition. They get they, um, aromatization, right? They take the TRT and it turns into man cans or something, <laughs> <laughs> right? right? I mean, if, if you're not healthy, that's what my understanding is, is if you go and, and take something uh, you know, exogenous, and you're not healthy, you're going to aromatize it. You're going to turn it into estrogen. I, I don't even know. I yeah. Don't know. <laughs> I mean, but. I feel like if, if, I, if I've done everything and I'm at uh, you know, level five and I want to be at level seven or I'm at level seven and I want to be at level nine, then I'm open to you know, any idea. Sis has been talking, with this, talking about me with this for, for you know, many years. Why do you think it's been a moral issue for you um, with... Uh, rubbing elbows with some of your friends who made a different choice. Um, you pro- I'm just going to guess and say that you probably didn't feel that they were so morally unsound that you just would completely remove yourself from their life. So like, why, like why, why is a, why would utilizing a performance enhancing drug for you? Why would there be a moral dilemma or hang up for it? Oh, right now there wouldn't be because I'm not in the WADA official sporting uh, Years ago when you were a triathlete and you started to have a good understanding of like, oh, it's, all right, well, these guys take this, this, and this. Was it more of a health thing or was it more like, I'm not doing that. I want to see what I can do more on my own. Oh God, it's not a freaking health thing. And that, that, that part, I think we need to blow that myth out too, because if you're a Tour de France rider and you're putting your body through that kind of pain and suffering every day. If you jack yourself up on EPO and testosterone, you are going to be vastly healthier coming yeah. out of that than, I mean, what I did to my body for those nine years of triathlon circuit was extremely unhealthy. I just fried myself. Mm-hmm. I would test my you know, hormones and my testosterone was routinely between 200 and 300. It's like from 189 to 290 was my range for those years when I was racing. And now it's 1,000 when I'm 57-year-old old man. So yeah. I, you know, I was not healthy in any way. So I would have been much better off doped off my ass while I'm riding my bike seven hours through the Sierras, for sure, mm-hmm. with no adverse health consequences besides the, everything you're doing is unhealthy in a way. So it wasn't, it wasn't that. And, um, you know, I, I, I competed all the way through assuming that I was racing against clean athletes or perhaps this guy that cheated, got busted and good riddance to him. Fuck you, go take your two year, four year ban. I mean, you deserve it, right? I mean, so that didn't bother me. It was like, and if they're getting away with it and not getting caught, you, you know, you control what you can control. And um, so maybe you never got to that inner circle of like, people just being really open about. Yeah, it was not It was not a dirty, triathlon I don't think was a dirty sport in the late 80s, early 90s. And I think, you know, when the- Were, co- were those things even illegal at that time? Yeah, yeah, we get tested all the time. Yeah, I got tested many times, mm. yeah. Just um, people knew how to pass it. Huh? Just people knew how to pass it. Uh, at that time no, or no, I don't think I don't think it was a dirty sport. I think oh, the, the, okay. the sport was too close knit. Yeah. It wasn't multi million dollar professional contracts like you have for the NFL or whatever, where the incentives are so high. And then in cycling, like from reading the books and the culture, it was like this is the culture. It's been the culture for a hundred years. You know, mm-hmm. they used to take um, cocaine in the tour in mm-hmm. 1923. They did go stop at the roadside thing and get Let's go. whatever. And so. Uh, I think yeah, that's, even the ancient Greeks and stuff that you pointed out, I'm sure right. they just took whatever. whatever uh, they did. They had they had all kinds of performance enhancing substances. Yeah, yeah. And so I think you know the testing bodies have a tough battle, like in MMA, and Nowitzki is trying to get you know mm-hmm. this thing heightened up to where people are going to be deterred from from trying it due to the penalties. And I think there is a there is a plug for morality somewhere because you know like I could cheat in a triathlon by 
holding my breath at the at the first buoy and swimming underwater and waiting till the you know you know like you could if you want to cheat mm. to make money because I'm a professional there's all kinds of ways to do that mm-hmm. better than you know doping cheating and winning yeah there was this um, German racer named Nina Kraft she won the Hawaii Ironman and she was one of the best of her time in the late 90s and um, she got she got busted for EPO after one of her victories mm. and to her credit she had a great immediate confession and she said I screwed up. I got injured early in the summer. I panicked. I didn't think I was going to recover in time. There's so much pressure on me. So I took some drugs and I'm really apologize. And the thing is like she won the race by like 30 minutes. <laughs> and so if she hadn't been doping, she would have won by 12 minutes or something incredible anyway. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was kind of a, I like when you have that window to the confession to see like, wow, this is what, you know, I, I feel that athlete's pain and their conscience and they, they're explaining it just like Tyler writing a book and the other guys, Floyd Landis writing his book. And it's like, wow. Okay. Now I know, now I know, you know, a bigger perspective of how, how athletes make these decisions, why Lance had to sue his, every single person that was, you know, tearfully confessing and telling the truth mm-hmm. and lying under oath. And, you know, you see those videos on some of the documentaries where it's like, how many times do I have to tell you I've never taken anything? You know, it's like a, a politician with the finger. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry for asking, sir. Uh, next question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is an argument to made though about what you were mentioning, where a lot of these athletes they train so much where they're like tanking their tests. Like for example, in in natural bodybuilding where they do get tested, um, you'll get a lot. You'll if you test any of these athletes a few weeks before they end up stage, you look at their blood levels. Test is tanked. You know, I mean, even even myself, like I had no sex drive for the last like five months of my prep because I was so fucking lean and I was eating bare, like thirty grams of fat. Right, so for some of this shit it's like it would be it would be dope if <laughs> yeah dope be dope to it have would, some dope right now it would be <laughs> no no but but it would be cool to have something where at least the athletes are at a baseline level of hormonal health mm-hmm. But, you know, if you add one thing, then everyone's going to try to find the next thing to get the edge, right? So if this is allowed, well, there's going to be guys that are taking this. And yeah. It's it's a tough thing. Yeah. Why, why do you think... Uh, why do you think performance enhancing drugs are even banned in something like endurance sports? Like yeah. you're mentioning like, it's already pretty unhealthy already. Yeah. That's probably agreeable. Yeah. yeah. Right? Oh, Is yeah. it for the health and safety of the athletes we want to ban these drugs? Come on. Yeah. No. Just for, I, what, I think for public perception? Yeah. And you know what? I had a guest on my podcast, Shelby Houlihan, recently, and she's... Because um, I think, like, yeah. when when you're saying these things, like, for me, I get excited. Like, when you're saying, like, the guys would prick themselves with a little bit of EPO yeah. every day, I'm like, yeah. good for them. That's fucking yeah, great. Yeah, that's right. They're smart, and they're yeah. racing for big stakes. And um, Shelby is a huge victim of the doping system because she tested positive for a very, very trace amount of nandrolone, five points, mm. five nanograms where like a therapeutic dose for performance enhancement is like 400 to 500 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but she she got busted, busted in quotes. And she's like, I don't know how this shit got into my body. I'm a clean racing athlete. I had a, a burrito, a pig burrito at the food truck and you probably heard <laughs> oh, the burrito oh, you girl. guys, Yeah, you guys uh, yeah, gave yeah. a little plug to her. Yeah. But the story is tragic <laughs> because she's like deer in the headlights going, she's training hard. She's the number one female middle distance runner in America, American record in the 1500 and the 5,000, the same events that Inga Britson runs. And she's like, oh my God, I'm freaking out. I have no idea. Had to hire a lawyer. They had to figure it out. They had to mount a case because the burden of proof is on the athlete. She spent her life savings that she earned so hard on the running course and they denied her case. They're Mm -hmm. like, no, it's improbable that you got this from the pig because that was their defense. (laughs) And so like, she's like, I don't know where I got this into my body. It's a little fractional amount that now, you know, they're picking up these these drug tests can pick up the most basic thing, who knows where she got it from? Mm -hmm. She's banned for four years. And so like, do we have to test athletes to the extent that we're kicking out a clean, hard training athlete who's winning golds for America? And it's it's another question to reflect upon. It's like, this system ain't perfect. She's highly believable. Is there other areas where people are cheating and it's like pretty common? Like, <laughs> like have you ever done anything to your bike or have you ever done anything to your shoes or yeah, ever done anything with right. the swimming? Like, yeah. Uh, what about the, the altitude sh- tents, which there's an affordability quotient there where you can spend $12,000 and sleep at high altitude and live in Sacramento mm. and get the benefits of both worlds. Mm. And it's like, you know, that's not fair. And then speaking of affordability, like, you know, an athlete who doesn't have the the means to defend themselves against a positive drug test, mm. they just have to suck it up and be banned for four years. 
that that makes me more upset than the possibility that some of these athletes are maybe micro dosing sometime or yeah. you know boosting uh, and then you know like what about creatine what about this where's what or the, what line the, uh, do we draw you know bike could cost a fortune right oh, like Lance Everything. Armstrong's bike I think weighed like as much as like a paperback book or something oh my god shout out to Sacramento sir. by the way because someone here stole his bike nice. oh that's right <laughs> I remember that yeah. <laughs> yeah and it was like such a signature bike like go. anyone riding on the bike trail with that bike oh my gosh like are you kidding me it's like stealing the Van Gogh like <laughs> yes here over in my in my study I have an interesting painting oh isn't that the one of the kind of priceless artwork like, who's gonna steal a Van Gogh and put it on their wall it's like yeah. so maybe great. there's an undercurrent of like you know black market art appreciation people come in my basement i'll show you my stolen collection yeah, yeah. oh but you know what back to your question like um if i'm doing everything i can mm -hmm. and i want to be better and i feel like i'm frustrated and i'm stuck at a, a you know at a crossroads i would be open to it because it makes a lot of sense that like look there's no downside risk like uh you're gonna you know you're gonna increase your risk of cancer because your testosterone is too high, it's probably the opposite. That's more the case that you're going to, you know, proof yourself from a lot of breakdown and uh, metabolic disease because you're out there working out, maintaining muscle mass and by any means necessary. But first of all, we should go get into our training protocol, do the best we can. And then, it's, you know, then, then kind of talk about the, the add-ons mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I don't eat anything. I don't, I don't allow anything in my body that's impure, like, uh, you know, vegetable seed oils or processed sugars or processed foods. I just don't. And I, you know, I don't have any desire to either. And so um, I, I'm checking all the boxes, but we'll see what the future holds. I'm, I'm trying to remain open to, to everything. What, what did, did you, you learn? Uh, oh, guys. I was going to ask just, what did you think of the, uh, the Icarus documentary? Because in that, it, it made it seem like um, all the steroids in the world wasn't going to help this guy become, you know, one of the best. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's a ton of other factors, and um, back to all that Liver King fun stuff. Um, look, let's take off 12% if the person is juiced up, right? They're having this huge advantage. They're way bigger. Take 12% off Brian. What do you get? You get a fucking shredded guy mm -hmm. who trains harder than almost any human and eats with more restriction. And, and on that note, like uh, we we have never seen. Um, an athlete training at that level and eating with that level of strictness and purity. And right and now, so you you're put those about together. Liver King, yeah, I'm right? talking about Liver King. And okay. like, you know, in contrast, like Matthew Frazier, one of the greatest athletes ever on the planet, he talks about, you know, chomping on Snicker bars in between <laughs> his workouts and whatever. The, 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 the main mm -hmm. athletes are having their cheat days and the, the guys in the NBA and NFL. But um, Liver King's going on a five day fast every quarter preceded by a failed hunt, he calls it, which is an extreme glycogen depleting workout. I don't think any athlete has ever pushed it to that level. And that's how you're going to get veins and complete shredded year round. I mean, it's just, let's have a bunch of other people try that. They're going to look like liver king. So that in, in my mind, like, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a funny thing. And I love how he takes it where he's like, what an honor to be accused of, you know, of doping. And I have my own story there because when I was um, uh, my first year, I think I talked about this on the last podcast. I was a rookie triathlete. I quit my job as an accountant and I was training, training and loving the lifestyle and going to the races and getting my ass kicked by the, by the top guys. Mm -hmm. But I dreamed of being there someday and I was always improving and I was totally focused on my own personal improvement. So if I got 21st in a big race, I'd notice that my, my run time was the fourth best of the day. And all I had to do is improve my swim a little more and improve my bike. So I kept working hard, working hard. And then I went to this big race at the end of the year and I upset the two top ranked guys in the world. And I was completely out of nowhere and no one knew my name. And that's when I got all this attention immediately and the sponsors were calling and it was such a great moment in my life. And yeah. then I did it again. There was a rematch and I beat the same top guys. Everyone was gunning for me. And now I was showing that I was deserved to be at the highest level of the sport. And I'd got there really quickly in my first year. And I remember I got this feature magazine interview from the best magazine. The guy talked to me for an hour on the phone and I was so excited to be like, they're gonna do a story on me? Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. tell me about your training, Brad. And you ran at UC Santa Barbara, but you got injured a lot and then you'd store triathlon. Yes, sir, and it's been really great and I'm so excited to be here. And then at the end, I, I, I realized he was working me the whole time to get a scoop. And at the end, he's like, hey dude, 
So like off the record, like what kind of stuff are you taking? Mm. And I'm like, what do you mean? We talked about my diet and my protein. He goes, no, no, man, come on. Like, are you guys, and, and my, my team, my training partner, Andrew McNaughton was also rising at the same time to a high level out of nowhere. And we were clicking, man. We were kicking butt and beating some of the top guys. Yeah. And so this guy had spent this whole time just trying to set me up you for up? me to admit that I was doping. And I was like, I, I finally realized what was going on and like my heart broke and I, I was like both, you know, just sad and just furious that, you know, to, to be accused of something like that because I had, had improved at such a high rate. Take it as a compliment. That's what yeah, everybody yeah. says. But I mean, it was, it was like a shocker. And so now I can relate <laughs> yeah, to like yeah, anybody yeah. who's, you know, you, you have fun with your people accusing you too. And it's like, <laughs> it, it, there's a certain fringe uh, emotion there where it's like, no, they didn't see you working out from seven to nine, man, and then coming back the next day and doing it again and doing it again and doing it again. And so um, it is kind of a, a, a slap in the face to go, oh, what shortcut are you taking? Yeah. Anyway. Power Project family, how's it going? I hope you guys are enjoying the episode. And I want to tell you, sometimes when you're a lifter, you need certain pieces of equipment that's going to help you perform a little better in the gym. Just like the hip circle is going to help warm up your hips, knee sleeves are going to keep your knees warm when you're squatting. The slingshot's going to help you bench a little bit more. But the cool thing is that Mark made all of this equipment when he was in the middle of his powerlifting career because he wanted equipment that could help him perform better as it can also help you perform better. The cool thing is that all this equipment was made for lifters by lifters. Andrew, could you tell them how to get it? Yes, that's over at markbellslingshot.com and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off your entire order. Uh, links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. It's interesting. Um, we, when you were mentioning the, the thing about <coughs> Liver King, how long have you known him? Uh, maybe four years now. Four years? And um, you want to talk about, like you guys talked enough about your visit there, like talk about a legit living human and I'm going to take partial credit for him blowing up on social media because oh, I was in his go. face in 2019 going, dude, you need to show your life to the, the public because there's so many posers and, uh, you know, uh, hucksters out there that are, that are passing themselves off as, you know, the biohacking king. And this is what I do. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed a 12% improvement in my libido. It's sensational. You know, it's like, come on, man. You seem to be channeling somebody specific. <laughs> yeah, anybody. <laughs> could, be, could be anybody. Could be anybody. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, 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 I'm tunnel vision, man. I don't even pay attention to popular culture. I forget who's president now. It's it all, it's all a burr. Obama. But, yeah. Yeah. But like, <laughs> love Obama. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but like, you know, to um, to be that legit, I think it's good that he's getting the, the credit he deserves. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's a great businessman, like you mm -hmm. said. And I've had interactions with him on, on a, a bunch of different levels. We promote that MOFO product together, male optimization formula with organs. It's um, one of the ancestral supplements products. And, um, you know, high integrity, high character, you know, straight shooting guy. And he's going for wins every day. And it's so motivating and inspiring. I like that stuff where he was talking about his kids. Like, I'd rather them hate me yeah. than hate themselves in 10 years. And I'm like, yeah, man, am I being too soft on my daughter? I mean, I mm. try to step up and go, you know, hey, come on, you know, uh, rally, you can do it. But There's a um, few people that yeah. hate your guts right now for talking positively about him. Is that right? <laughs> oh, well, you know, yeah. Good people for them. love it or hate it when it comes to him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think that's the whole point of this uh, d developing content is you want to get people thinking. And so right. if they hate this particular Power Project episode or whatever, that's fine because they're yeah. listening and they're getting riled up and then they're going to go, you know, express their own confirmation bias, which is fine too. And um, I'm, I'm really trying to do the opposite, like remain open-minded and think critically about the new information that we're getting to. Maybe this is a transition point in the show because you and I have been talking about a lot of stuff where it's like, Shit, my head's my head's spinning right now because right. I'm rethinking a lot of the foundational premises of ancestral living that I've been writing about nonstop for 15 years. And now I'm like, mm. shit, what am I talking about here? It's 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 like uh, you know exploding. Yeah, you found some different things uh, out about I guess like keto keto and uh, fasting and things <laughs> like that. You've been listening to a podcast. I forget what yeah, the guy's this guy, name is. Yeah, um, this guy plug for uh, Energy Balance podcast. Jay Feldman he does a fantastic yeah. job. His sidekick name is Mike Fave, and they go. I listen to a lot of his really yeah, good yeah. information. Yeah, yeah, and he goes hard. They go hard for an hour or whatever, and the, the the studies are referenced throughout the show. This study, that study. So it's not like these, you know hustlers like me talking about training, like, look at this guy, he's going 87%. I think it's a great new thing. You know, it's very regimented and science-based, um, but he hit me in the face with a couple key one-liners like um, fasting and keto turn on stress hormones. They're stress mechanisms in the body, and that is, 
in fact, the mechanism by which they deliver the highly lauded benefits. And so with fasting and keto and you get good at fasting and you get fat adapted and you get keto adapted and I'm never hungry and I'm alert and energized and I'm more productive at work, that's because you're under fight or flight mechanisms, man. That's why it's happening. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm reflecting because at 57, I get to reflect on a lot of stuff that you younger listeners might, you know, might hit there someday and go, shit, you know, I still want to be fit and healthy and, and be a peak performing athlete. And so I want to direct all the stress capacity that I have to my workouts and my stressful everyday life, right? I'm trying to run a business and deal with uh, being a father and uh, navigating this and that, right? I have enough stress. I'm not, I'm not short on stress in my life. And I'm saying stress in a positive and in a negative context. I'm not yeah. saying I'm stressed all the time. I'm like, I stress myself on the track. I stress myself high jumping. I love it. It's fantastic positive stress, just like going in and getting a workout. It's a fantastic positive stressor. Do I need to fast or do I need to restrict my carbohydrates to ketogenic levels so I can kick in more stress mechanisms and, and access those benefits? Or if we take these all as an aggregate, could it be possibly that you can err on the side of excessive stress? And I guess that's a personal reflection for everyone. And I think, you know, we've written best-selling books. There's a lot of people out there reading The Keto Reset Diet. It's still a bestseller, Mark Sisson and I. And most people who are grabbing a book off the bookshelf at Barnes & Noble or clicking, excuse me, because they had to walk to Barnes & Noble, um, they probably are sitting too much. They're probably not putting themselves, on, themselves under resistance load. They're probably not doing a lot of cardio. They're probably eating a lot of shit food. So going keto could be a tremendous mm -hmm. health awakening because they just kicked out the bagels, the ice cream, the rice, the soda, fantastic health progression. Mm -hmm. But if we're already working out hard and putting ourselves under sufficient stress and trying, like I'm hanging on by a thread trying to recover from my workouts at age 57, do I need to minimize all other forms of stress, including the metabolic stress of fasting, keto, low carb, time restricted feeding, all these wonderful things? And I'm becoming convinced that, like, um, you know, give me a, a reason why I should ever fast again during my busy, healthy, athletic lifestyle. Well, and I'd also say, like, you know, at 57, you're in tremendous shape. You're very lean. You have a good amount of muscle on you, but you could kind of also say, like, what's in your best interest at the moment you're in your best interest at the moment is probably to hold on to if not build even a little bit more muscle mass right rather than he's always saying that to me listeners i come in here every time a little bit more yeah get, just get a, a little, little more <laughs> yeah let's give you a little <laughs> tap of testosterone and <laughs> yeah a little bump, more muscle mass bump bump you up a little bit but yeah you know i think there's um a lot of people have uh done something like fasting because what is fasting and what is keto keto mimics fasting mm -hmm. uh keto is something that is supposed to help you to eat less so it's an overcorrection, right we kept we <laughs> kept uh, yeah we kept missing to the left with our field goals right mm -hmm. and now and now we're now we're probably <laughs> missing to the right and now we need to figure out a way to kick the ball down the middle and and what if you know what if you have breakfast and what if you just simply don't overeat uh, do you still feel great at, you know, if you have breakfast at eight o'clock, seven o'clock, and then maybe at 1 p.m., do you still feel good if that breakfast was something that is, uh, you know, good for you? You know, right. something that's, uh, I guess, like a natural food, like yeah. if it's a whole foods, it probably do. You probably do feel good. Yeah. Um, so, and I also think like there's so many different versions of fasting, Um I think like a fast away from your phone is a good idea. I think like there's certain things, like when I go out to eat with my wife, I, I usually will fast from my phone. I put my phone in a mm -hmm. drawer. I don't bring it with me. She has hers. If our kids need us for some reason, then they can contact her. Like stuff like that. I try to practice stuff like that often because I just think it's a healthy practice. For me, I love food. So mm. for me to fast away from snacking, is a really good idea for me personally. Mm -hmm. For me to have parts of the day where there's hours, hours and hours where I don't eat is also a good idea because I fucking love to eat. So um, I do eat breakfast pretty often. Uh, sometimes it's just a shake with coffee and other times it's an actual meal. This morning it was an actual meal. It just kind of depends, but I don't give a fuck. I don't care mm -hmm. that much about like the fast. You know, I, I did do some of that for a while. I did some of that for a little while. 
And then I also kind of recognize like, oh, this is nice to like manipulate my body weight and stuff. But every once in a while, my eyes will be like sunken in. I'll just look like, I'll just look really tired. Like this is not good. Yeah. And so I didn't like some of that. So I'm like, you know, what? I'm just not going to even worry. Like, what am I even worried about it for? Yeah. I'm already in pretty good shape. I feel good. Let me just go by how I feel. When I wake up, if I'm kind of hungry, this morning I woke up and I'm like, I'm cooking up some fucking bacon. <laughs> I'm cooking up some eggs. And I had some bacon and eggs and some fruit and it was delicious. And I think this is why it's so dope that we're not selling any type of diet here because this is the thing about nutrition is so fucking all or nothing. It's the most annoying thing ever. Yeah. Because if somebody says, oh, do the carnivore diet, they think you're perpetually doing the carnivore diet every single day of your life. And there's if you do if you eat some fucking fruit, like Paul Saladino talked about, it's not carnivore anymore. You know what I mean? There's so many comments of angry carnivores that were like, oh, God, he's eating he's eating fruit. Oh, my God, he's not carnivore anymore. That's Let's not call that carnivore. You're going to get fat eating that apple. Uh, Michaela Pe yeah. And, you know, Michaela Peterson in that comment section, she had a point because some people do carnivore because certain things give them autoimmune mm -hmm. issues. So those people need to stay away from fruit. But how about the people that can eat a fucking peach and not break out in hives? Yeah. They're okay. Yeah. And it's the same thing with fasting because this guy, Jay Feldman, it's probably really dope. And fasting is a stressful thing. Mm -hmm. But when you adapt, to the stress of not eating it's no longer feeling that stressful right very so, good come back yeah and, and that's the, right and that's the thing most people eat too much and eat too fucking often yeah. so maybe picking up a little bit of a practice of fasting for a little bit so they can understand how to feel not feel food focused is beneficial because nowadays i think in the beginning when we started fasting years ago I took it too far. Like I was fasting every day, 16, 20 hours and eating everything within a four hour window. So I backed off of it. Now I fasted this morning, but when you offered me a piece of chocolate, I was like, fuck it, I'll have a piece of that chocolate. I don't give a fuck, right? And it's not fasting every day. It's like certain days you're like, okay, I don't really feel like eating until later. And certain days I feel like eating breakfast. Mm -hmm. All these things turn into, they're like, they're tools in a toolbox. We're mm -hmm. like, stay out fast. Today I won't eat carbs. Today I'll eat fruit and carbs and, 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 and meat. Today I just don't feel like eating. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like you're not perpetually sticking to one diet for the rest of your life when you start implementing some of these things. Yeah. But when it comes to this shit, everyone's like, I'm a keto guy. I'm a carnivore guy. I do IFYM. It's like, dude, <laughs> it's, it's not that serious. Pick up the practice, get something from it, and utilize it so you can get whatever transformation you're looking for. You know? And yeah. you can implement it wherever you want. So you can use it if it fits your macros to yeah. your advantage. You can be like, well, I did pretty good today. Uh, maybe I didn't eat as much because I knew I was going to go to a birthday party or whatever. Uh -huh. And you want to just have that barbecue and you want to have the cake and whatever else mm. too. It's like, well, it fits my macros for the day because I don't care that much. And I, I didn't eat that much earlier. Or maybe the next day you spend a little bit of time fasting. I think... Our modern day intermittent fasting is like a joke. You know, it, really, <laughs> it is. It really is. Like I, I'm not. I'm gonna drive past all those grocery stores and not stop in and like get food, get fresh food. Uh, it's definitely like a modern, you know, United States problem, and uh, yeah. <laughs> if it is a problem at all. But again, the key factor here is just so many millions of Americans. It's quite obvious. Uh, the majority of us are overeating, yeah. and we need to figure out a way to correct that. Now, that doesn't mean not to eat at all. However, if you ever helped anybody who's very heavy, uh, sometimes it does have to be like really black and white. Like, bro, I got to stress this to you. Do not eat carbs at all. Like, yeah. don't fucking touch them. And usually that's a good message for some people because it's something that they can, it's something they can grasp. It's mm -hmm. something they can go into their home and they can communicate with their significant other and their family and say, this is what I'm doing. I, and they're like, hey, well, I'm confused. What diet is this? Like, oh, you see like, you know, where this says it's got 47 grams of sugar. I can't do that anymore. Mm. Nothing has any carbohydrate in it at all. And that's the diet that I'm going to choose for a little while mm. to see if it helps me, to see if it helps me personally eat less. And most of the people that you see that have done keto for a long time, they start to kind of have some different versions of it. You see Paul Saladino going through this different version of uh, the carnivore diet where he's starting to eat fruit. Is he going to start to put in like a vegetable? Is he going to start? <laughs> is Dark he, chocolate. Is he going to start to be like, oh, you know, potatoes aren't that bad or, <laughs> or rice? Like those things are probably coming next. It yeah. depends on what he wants to do. If he wants to get like maybe competitive in something or if he mm -hmm. wants to uh, even feel like he's got more energy, I wouldn't be yeah. surprised for him to be like, hey, you know, 
<laughs> organic <laughs> rice is not that bad or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Be. Oh, and 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 speaking of uh, speaking of criticizing Liver King or, or or criticizing Saladino for for twisting his thing. Oh my gosh! I mean, so many props to a guy who's fighting the battle for all of us at the front lines and digging into all the research and testing and refining. So I give him tremendous credit for modifying his original take of being, you know, a hundred percent carnivore and um, watching his funny shit on Instagram and shouting at the camera and like, <laughs> Sisson and I tried to sneak into Whole Foods and got kicked out. Whoa! And then really? he was in there slamming on the Whole Foods salad bar, which it so upsets me that Whole Foods, which passes themselves off as the, the, the place where they, they got you covered. And as soon as you walk in, you're good because they did all the hard work scrutinizing their products. And there's canola oil all over that store. It's like they might as well, you know, have a, have a, a raindrop walking through. <laughs> um, but yeah, we got kicked out. We tried to get official permission. We couldn't get official permission. So he, he bootlegged oh, wow. that video. That was good. You know, calling out the bullshit and, and being strong about it because we're fighting a royal battle with, you know, mainstream conventional dietary practice. And that's why I think all these, like you said, a toolbox, we need the toolbox because we're getting bombarded from all sides with like cultural messaging that it's okay to put this shit into our bodies our whole life. And then we're going to go visit people uh, in the hospital with cancer. And it's like, we have to wake up and start, you know, getting hardcore However that looks, and if it means buying 10 books and trying 10 different things, at least you're thinking about it. And whenever you skip a meal and you're fasting, you're breaking from cultural tradition, right? And so you're doing something that like, you're trying to take responsibility for your health. And so it has, it has positive benefits just to be engaged in any way with this stuff. Just like when uh, people go vegan from standard American diet, they have a health awakening from this extremely high risk and ill-advised diet at first, mm -hmm. but it is better than uh, Burger King and uh, Kukaroo and the rest of them. So um, then if we get further down the line, I think you guys are like, you know, the, the cultural trendsetters here to say, hey, I don't, I don't give that much of a crap. I'm having a piece of chocolate here. And that's like the highest level of, you know, sophistication of dietary strategy is to say like, you know, your body can fight off anything. And even if you're going to Chuck E. Cheese birthday cake one day a year. But I like how uh, Dr. Robert Lustig, author of Metabolical and many mm. other good books, one of the leading anti-sugar crusaders in the world, he contends that if you just eliminate processed foods from your diet, you can't get fat and you won't get sick, you won't get metabolic disease patterns. And it's as simple as that. And so that's some common ground. I can ground. get fat. Dude. You can get fat. It's harder. <laughs> yeah. It's harder to get fat, but yeah. you can definitely yeah. get fat. I mean, tell, <laughs> tell, tell me when. <laughs> right away. <laughs> I guess. Uh, I'll show you the bell jeans. <laughs> You'll be shocked. The, the bell jeans. Mr. Bojangles bell jeans were really big. Yeah. I mean, you you go fatten yourself up on steaks and eggs. Yeah. You know, you, you, went from, you went from six eggs to 12 eggs a day. And then you went from three steaks to four. There's a certain point where you're probably going to level off and it might be above our performance weights if we all do this experiment, but it's not going to be um, disaster. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of, you know, this, this talk about endotoxins, which you hear a lot of people talking about now. When you eat that processed food, you produce endotoxins. It's internally manufactured toxins that interfere with your ability to, uh, to, to burn fat or to, to mm -hmm. function mitochondria effectively. And so you start to get bad at burning energy internally. And so therefore, where do you trend to? You're reaching for more and more processed foods and, and sugary beverages just to get energy because you can't burn fat internally and everything's all screwed up because you have these processed foods in your diet. And so that sends you down a slippery slope and that's why I think zero tolerance is a, probably a good recommendation for a lot of people that are stuck mm. in this processed food sugar burning pattern is you got to you got to walk away from that stuff and get good, you know, get your body back in gear. Um, yeah, you got to break yourself away from that stuff. Yeah. Like Jay Feldman says, hey, if you say that you feel better from fasting versus eating breakfast, we got to go take a look at your breakfast. Because mm -hmm. uh, if you have a nice nutritious breakfast, mm -hmm. you're probably going to feel pretty good. And you might feel good fasting too because you've built those capabilities, but that's a good quote also. It's like, you know, get the shit food out of your diet. You're going to start feeling better. But then what if you, back to my personal example, because I have good blood work, I have good uh, uh, body composition. Um, where's my optimization? I'm looking at, I've been on a three-month experiment now to eat more food and see what happens. And I think you're bringing up a really excellent point. Uh, a lot of people in fitness, like if Andy Galpin was here right now, 
and he was observing us talking about even even uh, all of us here talking about fasting. He would be like, "This is a ridiculous conversation. Why are any of you guys fasting?" Mm -hmm. um, and that's just because, again, like we're already in good shape. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that's interesting is that somebody that is unhealthy and very overweight, what I've noticed is that they got to get themselves to a healthy point before they can start to really lose weight. Now they might right. lose some bloat and they might lose mm -hmm. some weight and they might knock off 10, 20 pounds. I've seen people do that before. Like, oh, I tried keto and bam, you know, this weight came right off. But there's like a little extra piece of the puzzle that after some of that initial weight comes off, they have to try to figure out how to get themselves healthy. And that is really hard because you're thinking that it would work the opposite way around. You're thinking, if I lose this fat, this is my road to success. I'm going to be healthier. But it's a little bit like being successful or it's a little bit like attracting a, a, a woman. It's a little bit like attracting uh, success where you have to first become a successful person. You need successful mm -hmm. attributes to then uh, be worthy of success. Uh, you need to... Um, we had a we had a, a Russian lifter years ago uh, explain to us how to deadlift, and he took the uh, uh, he took the rings the uh, uh, the Olympic the Olympic rings that you use for uh, gymnastics, mm -hmm. and he said he said this is how you deadlift, and he um, he said deadlift is like pretty woman, and he he pushed he pushed the ring away from him, and then he let it go, and the ring swung towards him, and he's like. <laughs> But most of you are trying to reach for the pretty woman, you know, and then he showed how it, go, like when you reach for it and grab it, uh -huh. it goes away from you. And I think that a lot of the stuff like this, when it comes to the diet and, and uh, when it comes to success, you have to first have the habits ingrained first. You have to start to accumulate some of those habits. How do you ingrain some of those habits? Sometimes you're going to have to go to like a boot camp almost. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're going to have to really go to war with it, make these black and white rules to where you're like, I'm doing this for 60 days. I'm doing this for 90 days. Um, Andy Frisella has 75 hard that he does. Oh, and, yeah. and it's a challenge and he gets rid of drinking and he tries to have people really commit to uh, something that they would consider to be hard for 75 days. But again, when you get healthy, none of it's hard because you leveled up and you're used to it. So it's it's a uh, it's a complicated thing to kind of get when you're on the outside and you're try you're you're very upset and frustrated with where you're at at the moment. Yeah. But it's those little tiny steps, that ten minute walk that you force yourself to do. Uh, you uh, you pushing off uh, a meal that you know that you shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Like those are the harder things to do. The decision to eat the good food isn't really that hard usually for pe for a lot of people. It's the saying no in the circumstances and situations that you're always in where you know the food's going to be compromised, watching a football game or going to the birthday party or <laughs> whatever social down. thing it is, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, real quick, there's, there is an aspect, though, that one should think about. You hear these anecdotes, like, for example, GSP has talked about how he feels more focused when he fights, when he doesn't have food in his system beforehand. A lot of martial artists talk about that. Um, and there's the aspect of, when you are in a stressful state, fight or flight versus being in rest or digest. So when you are in fight or flight, you are more focused. You are sharper. This is why a lot of people, when they start doing a little bit of intermittent fasting, they're like, oh, for some reason I can focus a little bit more. So the aspect of being under stress, again, is not a bad thing and it has to be controlled. This isn't something that you do perpetually forever, every single day. You fast for 20 hours, right? But it can be you, like, if, if I'm going to come to work and I eat a good meal, I feel pretty good, but relaxed when I come to work. I don't feel or don't feel as sharp. So the, the thing about this is, again, perceived stress is not, like you mentioned, perceived stress isn't always bad. It can actually help you focus in to whatever you're doing a little bit better. I noticed that with jujitsu. I don't, I'm not as sharp if I have some food right before I train mm -hmm. versus if I don't. And there are a lot of fighters who there are a lot of fighters who feel the same way about that. And then so, for you personally, you have a hard time stopping if you eat something, right? <laughs> what do you so mean? So it would be, it might I be. I can stop. Like, it, it's okay. like, I could eat a Before lot, training. but I'm not like, I'm not like once I start eating, I'm a fucking. I'm just it, saying like, if you were to eat like an apple or something <laughs> like that before you went to practice, maybe it would feel better, but I don't know if you messed with I've that. I've done before. that before. I don't like it. Don't like, like, this is a straight thing. I don't like to eat before I train. 
And that that's that's just one thing to think Two about. Two hours, there. three hours. I don't like to eat before mm-hmm. I train. Straight up. I just don't like mm-hmm. it. I don't like the way I feel. Um, if I were to eat something, it would be very light and it would be fruit. But I will not going to eat a big old meal before I train anymore. I used to do that in the mm-hmm. past, but I yeah. feel sharper if I don't. When, mm-hmm. when you say train, though, are you talking about like straight jujitsu or are you talking about like lifting? Jujitsu or lifting. Oh, okay. So I both. Don't, but this is the thing. When I eat food, if, if if it's on a day that I fasted or if it's on a day that I don't, I <clears> eat <throat> a lot of food. Right. Mm-hmm. So one thing that people got to remember is if you're choosing to fast, you need to make sure that when you eat, you actually fuel your body enough, which is the main mm-hmm. mistake that people that fast make with training. When they have their eating window, they don't eat as much as they mm-hmm. should. So then when they go and train, they're mm-hmm. not working with as much fuel as they could versus the individual who's eating throughout their day. These are the little nuances that yeah. can make something work and that can make something be disastrous for an athlete. Yeah. And in regards oh, yeah. to the uh, perceived stress. So like if I have something I have to do like early in the morning where I'm not going to be able to have like my full on breakfast, um, if I didn't fast or I didn't like have experience with it then I'd kind of be screwed because then I'd be like, what are we going to eat? What am I going to do? Like, I'm going to be thinking about it nonstop. Mm. But because I do, I do have this tool of being able to fast and be like, I'm going to be a little bit hungry, but we're good. And so like, I actually have significantly less stress overall. Now I know you're talking about like a different stress on the body, but I'm just saying like mentally, it's like, it kind of fades away because I'm like, oh, I've been here before. I've, I can, I'm totally good. Yeah. I like that. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just not uh, overusing I, the tool. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I told you I'm in this experiment now, three months of eating more food, eating more frequently, mm-hmm. waking up every morning, huge bowl of fruit, huge protein smoothie every day versus previously it would be like nibbling on some squares of dark chocolate, maybe till midday, 11, 12, whatever. I made a big meal, whatever. And so I'm, I'm, I've am I'm, lost some, I think, uh, fat adaptive uh, metabolic flexibility. Like now- Do you I'm really like, think you have? Oh yeah, yeah. Like at three o'clock, if I haven't eaten anything, I'm like, I need to get something to eat. Like just like the old days, mm-hmm. whereas, you know, I haven't felt this for over a decade because I've mm. been locked into, I guess, sort of a, you know, primal paleo, low carb, uh, experimenting with, you know, this this fat being the main goal. And now, um, you know, Jay Feldman saying like fat survival mode. Fat is survival fuel. And we should be burning carbs as our priority. <laughs> I'm like, wow. wait a second, man. That's super radical. But um, you it's know, this, radical, this idea yeah. of like um, energy optimization, mm-hmm. where you're constantly fueled and your ATP is constantly being restored, and so that you don't have to dip into these stress mechanisms. Because when you call upon cortisol, glucagon, and adrenaline, that's liberating uh, glycogen from storage, liberating fat from storage. And it's great and it's wonderful. And it's how our ancestors survived and how we evolved to be humans and, and keto, you know, <clears throat> ketone burning in the brain is so optimal and it's, it's low inflammatory and all these great things. But those are all things that we've called upon when we're, when we're starving. And so what's the opposite is like athletic peak performance. And now in my reflections, I'm also realizing as I attended the, the world championship track meet in Oregon and saw the greatest track and field athletes in every event for a week, practicing and looking at them, there are no, almost no examples of extreme dietary practices among elite athletes oh, in any no. sport. They're, they're sipping their Gatorade throughout their warm up. And they're eating crappy energy bars and they can all level up if they would listen to the show more. But it's pretty interesting to note that none of those people would ever think of fasting probably ever because they're working so hard and they're having such demand on their body and high calorie intake, like, you know, the NFL training table or, you know, the, the, the UCLA football team got, uh, got in also, trouble for like, they, they, they spend $45 million a year on food, Chip Kelly. And they do, damn. It, it, com- it comes out to like $45 and 22 cents per box meal per wow. athlete after every practice and every team meeting. <laughs> it's mm. like hilarious. But uh, that part is sticking in my brain too. That makes sense yeah. though. Yeah. You know? I would also say that uh, you were saying uh, there's no there, there's not that many extreme examples of uh, diet. I would also extend that into training as well, mm-hmm. like outside of the sport. Mm-hmm. Like I think that the athletes they play their sport, they do a great job of it. A lot of them do care about it. A lot of them are training, um, but extreme training and like really following these exact protocols that are again outside of like you showed the you showed the stats of the of uh, how the guy runs and stuff like that. Talking about outside of running, how many runners are really committing to to lifting and being really extreme with protocols? Like the best of the best probably are not doing that. No, not much. There's no more energy left. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, but they're they're fully fueled in general. Uh, the the top performers are fully fueled, whereas the biohacking community or whatever you want to call they're it, the extreme athletes. people, <laughs> right? But then you know, let's say our <laughs> they're not athletes like yeah. biohacking yeah. guys, like all yeah. these dudes, like and, and they're cool that they're in the biohacking community. But let's yeah. be real, they're not yeah. fucking athletes. Yeah. It's different. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. want to be in shape, they want to look in shape, but you tell them to go do something at a right. at close to an elite level, yeah. they're not going to do it. And yeah. I'm not bringing shade to that. It's just but true. Yeah. It's a different crowd. Yeah. Athletes can handle more calories because they are burning yeah. more calories. Yeah. And they need to make sure they're fueled up. Guys that are biohacking, ha they're, they're not the same. Yeah. Now, here's the question. Like w the theoretical longevity contest, who's going to win? Mm -hmm. The guy who's meditating an hour every morning and eating his lentil soup and his uh, single bite of a cucumber? Or is it going to be <laughs> some guy who's preserving optimal functional muscle mass throughout life uh, or, you know... Um, you know, keeping strong and athletic and explosive, like the hundred year old sprinter guy. Did I send you mm -hmm. that that uh -huh. link? He ran the pen relays. This guy, hundred hundred years old, he's running the hundred meters, Damn. and you know, forty thousand people cheering him on. So, and going, you know, pretty fast, like eighteen seconds or something, or twenty eight seconds. I mean, he's moving down the track. So, like, it's the guy like you, yeah, straight up, like well, the person who's continuing to mm -hmm. do the damn thing. Like, like you're doing it. You're gonna live a very long, but also a very virile life because you're not stopping. A lot of the biohackers, like they do these things so that they can get away with doing less. I'd love to see. I'd love to see some. <laughs> Truly, also, well, it's I'd also right. love to yeah. see some stats on people that are, uh, you know, trying or and or ending up being the best at what they do. How long they live? Yeah, because mm, that's, that's an right. interesting thing. I mean, like, how long is Jordan going to live? How long, you know, how mm -hmm. long are some of these guys? Yeah, it's a lot of stress. Yeah, it's a you, lot of stress um, on the body. I don't think it's going to be an ex Tour de France guy or even an Olympian. Because the, the you or know, a billionaire or a million, you yeah, know, yeah, multi millionaire. Going to the extreme is yeah. going to cost you, yeah. It um, can, yeah, yeah. Um, but again, like that guy's hauling ass, man. Look at him. That guy's yeah. like eighty or something, but uh, the, they're in the the old man's division. So that guy's pretty impressive too. But the slow so, guy is on the far good. left. Mm -hmm. He's wearing a white singlet, black shorts. He's the hundred year old guy. What's this age? Is this age group? A, so that's a like 80 to hundred or something. Wow. But yeah, that guy in the front was, was hauling at 80 and here's the hundred guy. If you're wow. watching on video, you can see Woo! Lester, Lester Wright, pen Still got relays. A good, uh, bounce to him there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, what, to what end, like how long do you want to live if you're not, you know, in that peak performance mode? So I'd certainly, I, I'd certainly hope that, you know, at a hundred I'm, uh, spry and having fun and going to track meets rather than um, being able to still meditate on my cushion for an hour every morning and eat lentil soup and a half a cucumber. It's just not, lentil you know. Soup. <laughs> I have a different, <laughs> I have like a little bit Fill different in interpretation of fasting too, just because again, people in the industry, like in this fitness industry, they, they get so dogmatic about each thing. And like, um, if I just didn't eat for three or four hours, I kind of consider that to be fasting, especially <laughs> coming from a background where I ate. It's not a fasting, lot. Mark. Yeah, I ate a lot more often. <laughs> it's got to be at least sixteen hours, and even then, that's just intermittent. Yeah, right. <laughs> so powerlifting, you're eating like a like a horse all day. So yeah, of thing. pretty yeah. much. Yeah, just yeah. any opportunity, even like any in, opportunity. Hey, in between sets, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, Someone <laughs> eat, eat some fucking pop tarts and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Someone left half a bar on the on the rack. You just grabbed it. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. People. Uh, People used to show up with like fast food and donuts and. Remember, you all brought like two bo or three boxes of pizza all the time. at the last oh, gym. Yeah, that? that shit was good I too. Know. I missed all of that. Ooh. By the time I showed up, it was like the, the week healthy. The week before, Mark was like, "No more," and it just stopped happening. I'm like, "Fuck!" And I was like super unhealthy, so I would have loved it too. <laughs> that would the been donut great. thing was really like it became a phenomenon. Like because like <laughs> I really remember that shit. Somebody donuts. brought some donuts one day, and we were filming uh, like a workout, and so the donuts were on this workout. And then people just thought that we loved donuts. So people would bring pe people that would travel to super training. They would always bring donuts. Oh boy! And it just every week. And I'm like trying to like be on a diet at the time Shit. and stuff. I'm like this diet's not it's not working out so good. That's where you need to get your toolbox out, I guess. And go okay. I'm going keto now for six weeks. Uh, something put something in the way. Mm -mm. But you know, I think uh, for me, like if I ate in the morning, like if I let's say I ate at uh, seven o'clock or something like that. Then I go out on a walk. Then I come here. We podcast. We might work out. We might podcast again or whatever else we're doing for the day. Um, by the time I get home to my house, it's like uh, probably 4 or 5 p.m. Um, if I'm going to go home, I'm not going to run <laughs> because I'm right. going to eat and I'm just going to chill for the day. 
So I usually make the decision to go and run. But I still consider that fasting. And even if I was to eat something, which again sounds funny with eating and fasting, because I might eat something so small, like again, a a protein shake and a coffee. A square of chocolate perhaps. Yeah, I I just don't consider it like a meal. It's just like, it's just a thing to carry me to the next spot. Yeah. Um, I might eat a piece of fruit or two, um, two or three hours before I run. And I don't consider that to be uh, a meal. I don't think about it as a meal. But the meals usually, if I'm gonna eat, I don't like, kind of like you're saying, I don't really like to do much uh, after I eat, unless it's way after I ate, mm-hmm. and or unless it's just like walking, something like that. Sure. Yeah. And then, Brad, when you are eating, um, what does your food look like? Because when you're saying that, like, towards the end of the day, you are starting to kind of slow down, I'm just curious, like, what you're actually eating. That's if I, you know, happen to skip a meal, which was so routine before, but now it's like I've, I've sort of like I've, I've taken a fork in the road. And once I think you turn on those appetite, sensors, you know, especially for me now in the morning, I'm, I'm used to fasting for years and now I have like a, a nice load. And so come around midday, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll be wanting more food and at <laughs> yeah, dinner, I'll be wanting more food. Waiting and, for one um, of you. you know, this is the interesting experiment. Like uh, Ryan Baxter, this primal health coach, I had him on my BRAD podcast. He did a very quantifiable, he's an engineer. He wrote down everything he ate for a year, Shit. calculated the calories, everything for a year mm-hmm. and did an experiment and added 600 additional calories from his previously logged year. Mm-hmm. So he went 600 calories up of always nutritious food. So again, that article, that um, argument back to eliminating processed foods, we can all agree upon that. And so he's adding nutritious calories to his diet. And a year later, he weighed the same, same body composition. And I'm three months into it. I, I still have the same body composition despite eating a ton more calories. I didn't, I didn't add it up to say it's this many, but let's say it's 600 a day. Where's that energy going? So arguably it would be, um, I'm more active. I'm tapping my toes more. I'm mm-hmm. thinking harder. I'm thinking more clearly. I'm recovering faster from my workouts, all those positive things. Um, I'm, not, I'm not getting fat from adding nutritious calories to the diet. And that's kind of an eye opener. Like someone tell me, someone tell me what's going on there. Dr. Herman Ponser, author of Burn, makes that really um, prominent claim his life's work that we have this caloric ceiling every day. And he studied the Hadza in Tanzania, and he studied inactive, relatively inactive modern citizens from around the world. There's tons of data on calorie burning. And the argument with this um, constrained model of energy expenditure is that we bump up against this ceiling every day, and we make an assortment of compensations. If we did a bunch of calorie burning during our workout, we have to borrow from reproduction, repair, and growth. Reproduction, repair, growth, and locomotion are a zero-sum game. So locomotion is everything you're doing to prep for your contest, so you are turning down the reproduction dial and mm-hmm. the other ones. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to ever do that, arguably, because we're pursuing health span and all these great things. Yeah. And so now new research is showing that that uh, constrained model only applies if calories are limited. Like the Hadza are barely hanging on. They have to kill baboons now instead of bison because they've been run out of their territory. So if there's a caloric abundance model, we can work out more, eat more, and be more active. So it's like this eat more, move more premise to where you're going to have more muscle mass. Rob Wolf said it straight up, one liner to me, said, if you want to live longer, lift more weights and eat more protein. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's different than do a 16-8 and uh, cycle in carbs on the weekend. It's like, boom. Um, you you want to be as active as possible, especially if you have anything less than optimal functional muscle mass, which most people are, are wish they had less fat and more muscle mass. So we want to go toward that goal, and that's going to be enabled by nutritious, healthy food. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. It does. I think that's kind of Saladino's thing is like, I'm really strongly believe that he's, uh, you know, he's hit upon this most nutritious diet, the animal-based diet. It's hard to argue if you have liver in a micro uh, micronutrient analysis, it's going to kick ass on the kale smoothie. It just is, no matter what anybody can argue. It's like we're choosing the most nutritious foods on earth, the eggs, the liver, the steak, whatever. Um, then you're adding in sufficient carbohydrates to help perform and recover and restock glycogen and help your hormones and your thyroid and all these things. It's very easy and nutritious to digest. You don't have those problems with plant toxins or interfering with uh, you know, your, your internal energy manufacturing. So you're getting a maximum amount of nutritious calories. Seems like a win. Yeah, eat enough uh, that it supports your training and allows your training to uh, be as uh, 
hard as you want to make it, mm -hmm. but don't eat so much that it makes you fat. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tommy Wood, the most sensible guy out there. I high, hold him in the highest regard, very smart guy, leader in the ancestral health scene. He says he tells his, um, his active clients, um, eat as much nutritious food as you can until you gain a pound of fat and then you dial it back a little and that's where you're at at optimal. Yeah. And so um, that doesn't give you a pass to have donuts and Chuck E. Cheese because you're gonna gain a pound of fat easily because you're gonna screw yourself up. But if you're going for the, the meat and the fruit and the, the omelets and all mm -hmm. that, it's like sky's the limit. You're gonna feel full anyway. I've kind of, even on a big bowl of fruit, there's so much water content, like you feel fantastic. You're not like angling around for a Pop-Tart, you know? Some of the studies that they've done where people have eaten like enormous amounts of fruit, the only thing that they've seen is just that people have bigger poop <laughs> rather than like the them fiber. gaining a bunch of weight. So fruit huh. is really interesting. Um, and, uh, and so is protein. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had people on the show before to, that have kind of referenced like the protein calories seem to have somewhat disappeared when we're trying to equate for them, when we're trying to figure out what the fuck right. happened to them in this mathematical e equation, it seems like they're not accounted for in some way. So the energy balance thing is definitely something that uh, I have always been in question of. And on top of all that, what you're talking about bumping up next to the caloric uh, intake per day, obviously the body does not work that way. Um, it doesn't work uh, on a daily basis like that. When you eat something like liver, you may have some of the stuff that's in liver uh, some of the vitamins and some of the other shit that we're not even aware of, uh, you could have that stored in your body for days and sometimes even longer. I think like vitamin A, vitamin D, uh, uh, vitamin K, like some of these fat soluble vitamins um, can stay in your system for a pretty long time. So your body doesn't just work on these daily basis. And when you go to do something and you go to expend energy in a given day, uh, that's not registering for that day necessarily. The, the body has like a long, in my opinion, has a long lag time. Sure. You know, like when does your body like recognize how sore it is from a particular workout? Yeah. It's like three days later. Yeah. So at minimum, the day, the body works in like a three day delay. What about when somebody tells <laughs> you something? What about when you start to develop a new belief? You sit there and go, fucking hey man what that guy said to me on monday really makes sense and it's now thursday <laughs> right it really starts to sit with you more. mine's two days mark yeah two days 48 hour well you, yeah. got, you got a quick turnover over there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah the, the body just is uh it's very complicated yeah. on like what it's trying to do and when yeah. it's trying to do it it's it's hard to really pin down exactly how many calories we burn versus how many we uh uh, how many we're taking in and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the effects of the workout, that's an interesting one because I can't figure that out. I'm I'm just still blown away. Like I thought I did a good workout and then two days later I'm sore and I'm like, oh, okay, well, it was over my limit, but I, it took took a long time to kick in, you know? There's a huge delay there. Mm. I think the stress hormones flowing through your bloodstream and all that, then you kind of have to allow yourself to bottom out once in a while and see that. That's why I was saying- and that's like, only what we yeah. can feel. Right. That's only what you can feel. <laughs> Who the fuck else? Who knows what the yeah. hell's going on? In All there? you know is like what the what the watch says or what the performance standard is. So, yeah. um, I, I hold those those you know those athletes I saw at the track meet. Whatever they're doing is working by definition because they're they're at the top of the world. So it's important to pay attention to that and to the scientific research. But I think we kind of get polarized and we don't like merge them together and, mm. and think more reasonably. Because, I mean, some of the science seems to be bullshit and you can figure out a way to draw a conclusion. You can back into a scientific conclusion mm -hmm. and everyone will pat you on the back and you'll get your professorship. But it's like, eh, well, it doesn't really work well in real life, you know? Yeah. I want to highlight something real quick that Mark mentioned earlier, but I want to mention it again since we've talked about so many different aspects of like how different the way we eat is and how we change things up all the time. If you're somebody who is currently or on the path to getting to a healthier body composition, let's say you're like 100 pounds overweight, 50 pounds overweight, et cetera, you mentioned like sometimes you, you need to just cut some shit out of your diet because <laughs> that, that restriction helps you get from point A to point B and it's working, all right? So if it's working for you currently, stay on that path. Mm. But now that if you've gotten to a place where you have a good body composition, your everything was working pretty well. Let's say you're a carnivore and it helped you get from point A to point mm -hmm. B. 
and you want to start eating some apples or oranges and see how that works, start doing it. You'll probably feel better and you won't gain a fuck ton of weight by eating a few apples and oranges. I've added in a lot of fruit. I haven't gained any weight from it at all. Same I actually here. <laughs> lost like a little bit. <laughs> yeah. No, same here. But, you, but you're healthy. That's the thing. You're, you're at a healthy body composition. And it's not like you can't do this uh, like if you are overweight, adding in fruit, but an aspect of it is that like, if you notice if you do that, then you start to just crave more calories and it makes sticking to your regimen harder mm -hmm. to get to your goal. Just don't do it for now. You gotta understand that the diet you're doing is the diet you're doing now to help you get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. But then when you're potentially at point B, because everything's worked well, you can be a little bit open to adding certain things in and see how they feel. You don't need to then continue to be dogmatic towards, mm -hmm. I'm keto and I don't fuck with carbs, or I'm carnivore and I don't eat fruit. You don't have to do that anymore. You can you can adjust. And if, if for some reason you eat an apple and for some reason you have a bad reaction <laughs> okay don't fuck with the apple you probably no, won't but <laughs> you know like then just don't fuck with it yeah just, how'd you get into uh jumping oh my gosh i i love doing it in high school I'm last time you're on the my, show were you yeah. doing long jump or high, high jump, jump rather high jump yeah yeah um okay. maybe not as obsessively as i have been doing since mm. yeah i actually i jumped in a meet in early 2020 and i was like just having fun. I jumped five feet, which is not that great. It used to be my warm up height, but that was years ago. Um, and it was like number one on the USA ranking for old guys. So then I started to get interested in master track. Like, hey, that's cool. No one else is bending over the bar at this age. Maybe I could mm -hmm. be good at something. You know, it's like I think uh, I realized from from that past life of being an athlete. Like, I never want to let that go. I want to have like this competitive intensity at all times and giving giving me an edge in some way in, in terms of my interest is athletics. So if it's an artist and you want to paint and, and do that and have that edge, it's like we have to have something that helps us, you know, stay focused and aspire to peak performance. Because I think modern life is getting easier and easier for a lot of people, not for everyone, of course, but mm -hmm. like if we kind of get lulled, I think we, we lose a lot of um, what's, you know, our humanity really. And so, you know, I've been long gone from, from triathlon racing and having that, you know, living and breathing that obsession with peak performance. But now I can kind of calibrate these goals to fit conveniently into the lifestyle of a 57 year old. I don't want to be out there riding my bike for hours every day, but it's so fun to like study the videos of the great jumpers and, you know, go see them in person. I was so thrilled in the stands and it just, you know, keeps, keeps the excitement going. So you were saying um, that you keep getting injured. Uh, yeah, man, it's tough. It's what uh, uh, what injuries have been occurring, and and uh, if you are like messing up, like what what do you what do you think you're where do you think you're going wrong here and there? Yeah, you know what? I think it's about um, governing that competitive intensity. So that great strength that's carried me through my life and made me the person that I am can also be my biggest enemy. And when I was a pro, for, for certain it was. That's why I tell them the story of turning around and bailing on my friends. Dude, why are you bailing? Because I'm a professional and I have to do this the right way and I have to stick you know, committed to my goals and values. And so I think even now, I have so much fun out there and I get so excited when I get to the track that I, I push myself pretty hard and it's no trouble. It's not like I'm puking on the, on the grass like in the movies afterward. Mm -hmm. I'm just having a great workout. I'm feeling good and pumped up and coming home and uh, going about my day. But then at the 24 hour checkpoint or the 48 hour checkpoint, it's like, oh yeah, I'm 57, fuck. What was I thinking out there? You know, I hadn't done anything uh, for the previous few weeks for whatever reason. And so these little tweaks, which um, I remember distinctly in my youth, they'd be gone the next day. Like, mm. oh, my glute is really messed up. And then the next day it's gone. Or which, which side was it, the right or the left? Oh, I forget. Um, so now they last like a week or two. And so that part, um, you know, it's an ongoing, it's ongoing process to do all that flexibility, mobility, prehab. I was going to ask, um, are you diligent about warming up before you do your workouts? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. all that stuff, there's no shortcuts anymore. Uh -huh. And um, that's been... For, for you younger listeners, like do it now, even though you don't need to, like get in that habit of respecting the heck out of your body. And again, back to the, the track athletes that I watched, they warm up so extensively, you can't even believe it. I mean, I've, I watched Elaine Thompson, one of the greatest female sprinters of all time, my favorite, she's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And she would go in the same spot in the practice area every day and you'd walk over this overhang and I'd just watch and I'd, I'd just be transfixed for an hour watching her practice her start again and again and do her drills again and again and again, the same thing. And um, they're just, you know, they're, they're committed to such a high level. And then they step out on the track and they do their, 
their race for the television cameras and you think they're so fast and so amazing, but mm -hmm. it's just the buildup that's really, that I have the greatest appreciation for, you know, behind the scenes. And so trying to model that and not, you know, you go out there, you feel a little twinge, you have to pull back and cancel the workout and come back when, when it's another day. And I'm still kind of, you know, messing that up a little bit and wanting it to, mm. wanting it to work out because uh, it's Tuesday or whatever, you know. It's hard when that when something does happen and you do feel like you've done, you know, you feel, feel like you did your homework. You feel like right. you did everything you're supposed to do and then yeah. you still get something in the calf or ankle. You're yeah. like, God, this just sucks. <laughs> and you just want to make it happen, but it's like, it's not the right day. Yeah, and I think um, I don't really want to turn off that all the way because um, if I just accept everything, like, oh, I'm not ready for it, or may maybe I'm too old to do this crazy sport of high jump. It's extremely, um, you know, challenging to the body. Uh, the Olympic high jumper Amy Acuff calls it a car accident, basically, because you're running up and you want to hit that foot so hard and basically break on that, and then your body gets flung over the bar with physics. It's um, angular momentum, it's called, and mm -hmm. so um, it's not like it's not like anything that the humans designed to do. It's going against uh, nature. You have to really slam your heel down into the ground. On Absolutely, purpose, right? yeah. You're a car accident. You're going fast at a curve, and then boom, hit the curve, and you spring over the bar. Yeah. You know, we had a uh, Cadorziani into the gym recently, and he's come up multiple podcasts now. But he has some certain things that he does to check in with his body, and I think that just taking that concept and having not just like a warm up, because some people when they think of warm up, they'll do like high knees or maybe mm -hmm. just do some lighter weight on a bar, but really having certain practices that allow you to check in with different ranges of motion you have um, with different movements, and you can see okay. This isn't where it should be today. Mm. I'm gonna back off. Yeah, a little like bit. a little checkpoint checklist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he has yeah. these movements that he does just to check in and see what he has for the day, and it gives him a gauge of like, ooh, I can go today, mm -hmm. or if I'm gonna back it off. I think those types of things, if an athlete can build whatever practice that is, then number one, it'll help them not get as injured as often because they have certain things that they mm -hmm. can at least look at, and it'll give them a better perception of like their internal battery. You know what I mean? Mm. I, like at this point, I can feel when I wake up after I do a few things like I'm going to have some really good workouts today or today my workout's going to be lighter and I got to back mm -hmm. off. I can feel that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't have anything, then you're just kind of, you're just sh shooting, shooting blind. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to do. Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen. And yeah. It makes things a lot harder. I love that. Yeah, some actual check. We got to pass through this gate, then this gate, then this gate. Show your pass, please. He Show actually calls them gates. Yeah. It's funny you said yeah. that because he calls them gates. Yeah, good you vision. Know what I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you were saying in your uh, powerlifting that you weren't going for those big numbers, except for in the competitive environment. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really good one. Like I said, just toning down everything to 87%. Yeah. If the greatest runner in the world is not going past 87% in training, and if you're not familiar with running and the numbers, that's huge difference. Oh, yeah. It's super easy compared to 100% effort. And like back in my days as a runner triathlete, we'd go and do workouts and we'd kill each other at 99%. Jesus. Because, hey, you have to prepare for what you're gonna do in the race, right? And the answer is no, you don't. Dr. Phil Maffetone's great about this. He's the leading endurance coach. You've referenced him a few times. Mm -hmm. He says, look, you do not have to train the brain to suffer. The brain is gonna be fine. If I come and put a gun to your head, we're gonna run a marathon right now. Even if you're not much of a runner, you're a runner, you'll make it, no problem. But mm -hmm. if I put a gun to your head, you're gonna run 26 miles right now with me, let's go. Yeah. You don't need to practice suffering royally. It's gonna be rough on you. You'll be right in the hospital after, mm -hmm. but you can do it. So you don't have to constantly put your brain under duress to be a tough athlete. And that's like blowing up the notion of tough coaches everywhere all over. It's like, yeah. you know, take care of yourself, um, you know, nourish that competitive intensity, harness it. And then the second thing you don't have to train extensively or for a prolonged time is the anaerobic muscle fibers because they're explosive by definition. So these workouts should be short in duration. That's not a problem in the gym because everything's short. But I'm talking about going and doing repeats of running around the track uh, 20 times, times 200 like he's doing. It doesn't have to be at your max because mm -hmm. those muscle fibers take a long time to recover and they're very explosive. And so what do you train extensively is the aerobic, the uh, oxygen carrying muscle fibers. They nourish the anaerobic muscle fibers anyway. So if you get more aerobically conditioned from just putting in the work every day at a comfortable heart rate, that's when you can build up to be even a fast explosive athlete. Mm. 
Yeah, it's 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 not an easy thing, you know. To uh, so many people get uh, kind of hooked on the, uh, the, the endorphins yeah. of kicking butt and crushing the workout. I mean, right. they say that term all the time. Let's go crush a workout. Mm-hmm. Well, you just crushed your chances mm-hmm. for you know doing well in competition. Now, most people maybe their competitive uh, ultimate is the Saturday session at yeah. the CrossFit box. Yeah. That's fantastic. Just put everything into perspective so that you don't have to, you know, play your big cards day after day after day. I think one thing that separates out someone that gets really good at something versus somebody uh, that just does it here and there or has a really hard time progressing is that uh, people that get really good or get to be great, they're like super in tune with how something's supposed to feel mm. or how something's supposed to kind of work out. Um I know for myself, when I got to my strongest, I could literally feel like I could feel like, oh, that was, that was the set. And sometimes I would do a set before it where that was lighter. And I was like, mm, that wasn't quite it. Mm. Like I need to either do another set with the same weight or I need to do another set with maybe a little bit more. And luckily for me, I normally I was pretty reasonable with that. A lot of times I would just say, look, you know, more weight is more weight. We already have a lot of weight on here. I don't need to put on an extra uh, 45 pounds on each side Mm -hmm. because that's kind of, you see that sometimes in powerlifting. People get excited. They lifted six plates really easy. Then they go right to seven plates. So things, things, things like that. And and again, mentally you're like, well, that's what I'm going to do that in the meet easy. Mm -hmm. So I should be able to do that. No problem. But then it's just getting outside of your getting a little outside of your training. It's like uh, you're kind of doing it for everybody else rather than Mm. just for yourself. And that's when shit gets to be, Mm -hmm. shit gets to be uh, weird. But when I did certain lifts, I I remember like I'd put the weight down on the rack and I was like, yeah, I got stronger today. Like we're good. Like I can fucking leave right now. I don't need to do leg curls. I don't Mm. need to uh, do glute ham raises or reverse hyper or uh, stiff leg deadlifts or bent over rows. Like I can go, like I squatted well, that went great. I got stronger. And if I needed to come back the next day and I don't know, do accessory work, I always thought the assistant stuff uh, was great because it's not barbell exercises and it's a mimicker. So like, I'm not a huge fan of like drills. Like you were saying, you were showing me some of these drills and I'm like, man, I fucking hate drills. <laughs> uh, because I always like doing the actual, I always like doing the actual thing. I'm not saying that drills yeah. aren't useful. But one of the things that makes a drill useful is that it's not sprinting. Mm. Yeah. Like sprinting is the most useful. A yeah. drill is a drill. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and a drill will help the sprinting. I'm not disagreeing that it <laughs> won't help. But do you kind of see my point? Like the sprinting is so intense and it can be so hard. We all recognize you can't sprint all the time. So then you therefore you have, to have to do a to, bunch of drills. You have to do a fucking drill that somebody made up. That's like, they're like, hey, this is what you, anyway, they drive me nuts. I don't, <laughs> I don't think you're a fan of drills either. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. He skips them. No, that's a warm up. Sorry, never mind. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> My apologies. My apologies. I'm already warm before I get there, bro. I know. Yeah, that drive is pretty. No, nah, I'm usually, I'm usually, I'm, I've always done a workout before I'm just you fucking with anyway, you. So. I think it's just funny. Yeah. It's, it's it's a, one of the better, well, I'll say one of the best dudes uh, in jiu jitsu over there is like also just skipping the warm up. <laughs> I don't need it. <laughs> Let's change the subject. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, tell us about this jersey that you're wearing. Well, you're wearing number an, 10. Uh, authentic U.S. soccer team jersey signed by Landon, Landon Donovan. Did oh, you, did you steal it from him? Does he not have a jersey? Maybe the greatest U.S. soccer player of all time. I Talk shit him. about yeah. the Kings, though. So I always, always hate him for that. Did he really? Yeah. Why? Uh, Why does he care? I know, right? But no, it was when they were like almost moving to Seattle. Oh, yeah. I don't even remember what he said, but (laughs) he said something. He's like, peace out. Yeah, something like, oh, try something else. No, it was some lame shit. Like, oh, I didn't even know Sacramento had a team. Like some bullshit like that. That's pretty good. And I'm like, hey, motherfucker, (laughs) you were playing in in San Jose for many years before the earthquakes moved, so quit talking shit. That's right. That's (laughs) right. I was going to see him going to mix the chocolate and the tasty pastry at the same time. Pastry. Spicy. Mm-hmm. It's all satisfying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it works. Fasting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's in my book. He's fasting. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Got to fuel up for the next podcast. Anything that's under, right. anything that's on, like any meal that's under like twenty five hundred calories, it's a fast. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Does this break a fast? Does that break a fast? 
Yeah. Four <laughs> eggs and a steak. No, that's fine. Yeah. I had salt in my water. Is that breaking a fast? Yeah. 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 We it's give got you calories. Permission. So the yeah. main thing that you're getting from some of this, uh, from um, some of the podcasts that you're listening to and stuff is just that you were maybe just overdoing some of the fasting and some of the ketoness. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I was never that strict, fortunately. Like I'd be writing about keto and, <laughs> and, and like <laughs> Eating in, my, in my own life, I had that intuitive, you know, need for more chocolate or something. So that, that and same with uh, Paul and Carnivore, like I was captivated by his message back in 2019. I lost my appetite for like salads and stir fry and these things that have been the centerpiece of my diet for years. I just looked at the steamed broccoli and I couldn't eat it anymore. You like, you like mess with my brain, you know? And it was, it was really interesting how that happened and how there's so much psychological association with what you are think you is back, good food. Are you back to eating some vegetables here and there? Oh, really? sure. I mean, yeah. it's only for being polite or if it's part of, um, you know, <laughs> fine dining, which I'm not engaging in every single day, but of course at a restaurant or yeah. whatever, you know? Um, but it's, you know, the fact that, they're not the centerpiece of nutritional density and that you may be harmed by them, that's pretty heavy. I mean, we should all reflect upon that. And I think, you know, I was doing these super duper green smoothies uh, inspired by Rhonda Patrick with her viral <laughs> YouTube video of dumping in the, the raw celery and the raw spinach and Broccoli the raw kale sprouts. and raw beets and whipping them up and all that stuff. And that would blow my stomach up for a few hours mm. every day after I had it. And that's because <laughs> it was an intense amount of raw produce that has high oxalates and all, all the other things. So I definitely reacted to that. But in general, I'm not a sensitive plant person that's going to, you know, break out after a peach. But that was a, you know, that was a, um, a, a huge dietary transition. And um, I forgot what the, the question was, but. No, I, I agree with you though. A salad, you know, a lot of times people that are, even, even someone that's trying keto, you know, they're, they, a lot of times uh, on a keto diet, you can have there's room for vegetables. And I think one of Mark's, uh, Mark Sisson's things was to have a big ass salad every day. Right. And, uh, I think when people do that, they think they're making a great decision, but they might be getting like a chicken Caesar salad, right. which is a good choice. Cause you got chicken, you got some protein, uh, you're having vegetables that's supposed to be good for you, but then it's done, you know, you dump a bunch of, uh, Caesar yeah. dressing on uh, there. And, and then the chicken is, uh, vastly inferior to the steak. We learned from, you know, recent, uh, Paul's hitting that message really hard too. And it's like, shit, a chicken salad's, it's like, you know, um, yeah. it's missing a lot of checkpoints. You know, that guy, Brian Sanders, peak human. Have you talked to him? Mm -mm. Uh, nose to tail.org is his meat company. And he has a podcast mm. called peak human. He has this scoring system for food mm. minus one, zero, oh, that's great. Or plus one. Plus one is animal-based foods with the nutrition. He says vegetables is a zero, basically. You know, it's um, mm -hmm. it, and and a minus one is processed food. Yeah, it's kind of a quick, a quick snapshot way of looking at it. But to put vegetables at zero is going to break a lot of people's heart. But it's like, <clears throat> hey, it could even be a minus one if you're one of the carnivore they, sufferers and the tremendous awakenings they've had. Well, yeah. they can get a negative because they could be a shuttle system for excess calories that you just don't need. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. you're thinking like you're going to get away with something because you're not eating a lot of calories when you're eating vegetables, but yeah. if you had Caesar or ranch on it, you might have had 30 grams of fat or 50 yeah. grams of fat. Nothing wrong with fat, but maybe the fat that's in there, maybe it's seed oils, maybe it's harmful yeah. to you. And it's a disaster. Basically. And maybe it's just calories that you just otherwise didn't need in the first yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you asked me if I'm overdoing it. I, I'd say probably not, but like now I'm reflecting what is optimal and how can I get from level seven to level nine. And so, you know, I don't think the fasting hurt me much either or the carb restriction um, that just came about mostly restricting processed carbs. But mm -hmm. I haven't eaten a lot of fruit in the last decade because we kind of came out saying, oh, the fruit's the most sugary and then the vegetables have the, mm. you know, the fiber and all these things. And now it's completely flip-flop thanks to the, uh, the information about the plant toxins and all that. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm eating a ton of fruit. And it's like, what was I thinking? This stuff's great. Mm -hmm. It feels good. Um, I, I know that um, <laughs> reference. I had this on a sticky note for years on my, on my wall. And it was Dr. Perlmutter saying, um, don't eat fruit in the winter because it's against our ancestral experience and our ancestors probably ate no carbohydrates and therefore, you know, we're not genetically adapted in the, in the long cold days of winter. And I'm like, 
what fucking winter are you talking about? Because you see those lights that illuminate the super training gym at 4 a.m. December workout or the 72 degree thermostat on the wall or the, the track workout that I'm doing. Or wait, last winter I went to Hawaii twice because Southwest Airlines had an $80 ticket sale. <laughs> we pounced on, no, no, we went three times because it's like, wait, are you kidding? Nonstop Sacramento to Maui for 80 bucks and mm. my sister just moved there. Boom, we're there. Boom, we're there again. Boom, we're there again. So my winter consisted of nice, sweaty, hot hikes and and sprints on the beach. And so it's like, why are you telling me not to eat fruit in the winter? It's a very sensible and respected uh, message. But, but it's it, not like, the same fruit that our ancestors ate. It's genetically modified, right. Brad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Denise Minger's got a great comeback on that on her blog about all this super sweet natural fruit. And, you know, it's kind of like all those comebacks is it's time to second guess that stuff. And, um, Maybe, uh, you know, be open to experimentation and, and new ideas is my goal because it's so easy to get, you know, locked in. Could you imagine with, giving a caveman like a modern day nectarine? He, he yeah. would abandon whatever the fuck he was eating before and just eat yeah, tons yeah. of those. He would and, be like, this is fucking unbelievable. You know, not only that, um, Tommy Wood, again, re referencing research, like today's elite athlete, like CrossFit Games, the competitors, what's it, this weekend or something? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the finalists in CrossFit or the people at the Olympic, uh, the World Championships track and field I saw do six times more physical energy expenditure than the busiest, hardest working hunter gatherer throughout history of humanity. Six X, you know, there was no hunter gatherer that was doing Matthew Frazier <laughs> workout. Okay, now time to run a mile with a 15 pound weight vest and 608, none. It's, I mean, they had some hard times and maybe a lot of them had some easy times, which when we romanticize our ancestral example, it's like, wait, uh, I look at Oppenheimer's, there's a, a website called Oppenheimer's Human Migration Across the Globe. And it might be down right now, but it's one of the greatest learning tools. It's amazing where we started in East Africa and he's got arrows and timelines and you hit click and then there's more migration and it shows the pattern of human migration. We actually went from Africa over to Indonesia first, Australia area, then went back and then went to Europe. So it was like all that stuff is earlier than our first humans in Europe because the ice age and things like that. But we migrated along the shoreline of India and you know Africa, India down and around. So they might've had a shit ton of fish and mm. easy pickings where they could lay on the beach and uh, reproduce and maybe not be super fit uh, you know, romanticized individuals that could carry big heavy stone. Maybe they just lived in a, a, a straw th hut for, yeah, look at that. Wow. So um, some people think that only 120 humans were the original successful departure. So in other words, most of us descend from 120 people mm. that were brave enough to leave Africa and then go and, and make it all over. Well, it must have started with less than that at some point, right? And then mm -hmm. anyone that has pure African genetics today, David Epstein references this stat in his book, The Sports Gene, um, the genetic disparity between two members of the same pygmy tribe in Africa is greater than the genetic disparity of the rest of humanity combined. So two different, tr two tribal guys are more different than all of us put together. Yeah. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. It's funny, I did yeah. a 23andMe because uh, all my relatives are in Nigeria. Um, but if you do a 23andMe, most people have some Neanderthal um, yeah. DNA or whatever, uh, a certain amount of variance. I have zero variance because we've just been there the whole time. So like I'm 100%. <laughs> I did that shit because like some of my relatives are like super light skinned. And this thing, people in Africa can vary in terms of skin tone. There are people that are your skin tone, but they're black people. Yeah. They're 100% yeah. African, right? So I was like, is there anything else in here? Nah, I was 99.9% .9 West See, African. See, that proves you're a genetic freak because- No, it doesn't prove I'm a genetic freak. It just proves I'm 100% African. Well, no, you're, you're going to have <laughs> the most extreme examples, let's say, of athletics in the most pure uh, the most pure African genetics that haven't been diluted and watered down and watered down again and watered down again and watered down again. Mm -hmm. So um, 496 of the fastest times in the 100 meters come from athletes of West African ancestry. Oh, Jamaica, USA, whatever, uh, you know, they're from different countries. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty heavy, and they believe it's from um, the malaria resistance, g getting more anaerobic muscle yeah. fibers. And so your, your talent pool is there for explosive fast pace. And then in East Africa, in a small area of East Africa, the Great Rift Valley comes 80% mm -hmm. of the fastest times in distance running, marathon, 10,000 meters, 5,000 meters. Most of those athletes represent Kenya or uh, uh, Ethiopia or USA or whatever, but um, 
that's the greatest concentration of athletic talent um, you know that you can imagine and it's because those guys um, trace their ancestry back really deep and so they can be more more disparate and have you know mm. amazing genetic gifts yeah. and of course who are we watching on the starting line definitely the fastest West African ancestry of all those with West African ancestry because there's some slow ass ones too you might have, <laughs> you know you might have the slowest sprinter ever <laughs> from Nigerian ancestry right there next to his cousin who made the Olympics uh -huh. theoretically uh -huh. you know yeah that's Wild. just crazy man yeah when we have Dan uh, Gardner or Gartner on the show I've forget how to pronounce his last name, but uh, he'll be on the show pretty soon, and we'll get to the bottom of a lot of that stuff, because he knows a oh. ton about uh, genetics and nice. things like that, <clears throat> so I'm super excited to get an opportunity to talk to him coming up. I had a question for you, Brad, because this is something that I found pretty interesting. Is it about Sorry. the chocolate, the spicy chocolate? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that sounds pretty good, but... That's amazing. As you start to eat more fruit, right? Um, more fruit, more protein, huge, giant protein smoothie. I'm going to give that a lot of credit for just recovering better and keeping, I guess, keeping, uh, you know, appetite in check too. Like I'm, I'm trying to eat more, but it's all good food. Yeah. And it's like, I've had enough. I had enough steak. I mean, I eat it every day mm -hmm. and um, I can see people that are struggling. Like you mentioned, those people that are trying to lose 50 pounds. It's like, how about filling up mm. with, you know, and yeah, less maximum energy. Real food. Don't screw around with extended fasting yet because we might be, when we're not looking, see that guy hit the Ben and Jerry's on Tuesday after his 16-8 day on Monday. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. tough unless your, your energy uh, you know, mechanisms are working well. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, the, well, I was going to ask you this about like, um, in terms of like your cravings now, because cravings aren't necessarily bad. It's just what do you turn to when you're typically craving food? Because if you're turning to Snickers bars, fast food, et cetera, things that are put together so that you'll crave more and more of it, <laughs> you can't necessarily trust yourself when you're like, I'm hungry. Yeah. Like, are you truly hungry or are you hungry because you're used to eating Doritos yeah. and Oreos and all this processed food that is, when you eat it, you crave more and more of it. But when you're eating whole real foods, you know, it it becomes much easier to actually trust when you're actually mm -hmm. hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where a lot of people are. A lot of people, when they say I have crazy cravings, they're coming from a place of eating a lot of highly palatable processed mm -hmm. foods all the time. Mm -hmm. Where now when they're when when their body says I'm hungry, you don't need more. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So how are you feeling? Like you don't feel like I know you you mentioned that like you eat a lot of fruit and shit, but like you don't feel that you're 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 overdoing anything, right? Not at all. No. And it's exactly. also like um, yeah, ghrelin turns off after 20 minutes, right? So I'm starving my ass off and I need some food right away and I can't wait to eat. But if I don't, um, it's going to go away in 20 minutes. I'm going to start making more ketones. I'm going to sail through the afternoon, but that's, you know, that, that's all great content and it's, uh, a pull quote highlight for the book or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, uh, using cold exposure to, to lose excess body fat, I've been doing some research on that topic because it's kind of cool. Like, hey, jump in the cold tub and your weight loss will be accelerated. Ray Cronice's work has proven that pretty, pretty interestingly how he has a lot of clients and he himself lost a lot of weight just from getting cold frequently and all that. And so all that stuff works. But again, it's <clears throat> stress mechanisms getting it to work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, right now, like my last blood test, my insulin's 2.3. Uh, my triglycerides were 27. My, my numbers look good. And so um, I'm not trying to challenge my, um, my, my fat burning mechanisms or accelerate something. I'm just trying to get to what is optimal. So I guess it depends on where the, the, the listener viewer stands right now. Yeah. And if you have some extra gut you want to get rid of, then we have to go on this boulevard rather than this one. And like Mark said, you got to get healthy first. You got to get rid of that processed food. And people are really banging this drum really nice now. Kate Shanahan has been doing it for a decade that the industrial seed oils cause mitochondrial dysfunction, cause dis dysfunctional fat metabolism. And so if you can't burn energy yourself very well, you're going to crave the Oreos and the foods that are put together for that uh, for that purpose. So we've become a society that's dependent on that's a really these interesting, drugs, basically. <laughs> that's a really interesting point. There are people that burn the same type of calories less efficiently than somebody else. Oh yeah, that's, that's what obesity is. Yeah, right. I mean, obesity is storing excess calories 
uh, for years and decades because you're not able to burn them. And you got to give a plug to, hey, get out and exercise more because that is a huge important factor factor for it. Mm -hmm. But it appears, I'm not the scientist to make the final conclusion here, but it appears when those processed foods are in the mix and those industrial seed oils inflict damage immediately at the cellular level, showing that they'll render mitochondria less functional and less able to burn energy from the body, you're totally screwed and you're not gonna willpower your way out of it. You're gonna walk into um, the, the, the 7-Eleven and, and go for the ice cream at nine o'clock at night or whatever. Yeah, you gotta sleep a lot, you gotta exercise, you gotta hit all these checkpoints, but if we're not, if we're dealing with processed foods, we can't, we can't even listen on further on the show, really. You know? And it, it also might take you years to get away from processed food. Well, I hope not. You know, I for mean, some people, how much take... of a scare do we need? How much, how many times do you want to be I just slapped mean in like, the face, you know? I just mean like literally, like for people that are heavy, like it might take them a couple of mm -hmm. years to distance themselves. Like they can work on it and they can get better at it. Mm -hmm. They could go a couple days. Yeah. Um, they can go a couple weeks. They could start to go a couple months, but it's going to be very, it, it takes a lot of time. Yeah, it lures you back in. Um, yep. Another book from Dr. Lustig, The Hacking of the American Mind, and talks about how the, the, the marketing forces are luring us into these dopamine triggering instant gratification behaviors, uh, mobile devices, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, video games, porn, sugar, alcohol, street drugs, prescription drugs. They're all triggering and flooding the dopamine pathways of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so we are, you know, we're at a loss here. It's, it's hard to extricate because we're literally addicted to them. And it's not for the hit of pleasure like we often talk about. It's just to get to baseline as you need in, in the terms of food. You need those foods just to have energy to get up off the couch because you yeah. feel like crap because you can't burn energy. And so you get a hit of ice cream or 7-Eleven Slurpee, and then you got an hour in you to finish at the, at the office and um, what, you know, what's, what's going to hit us next. So um, I think... You know, it's like it's like Paul shouting his Instagram <clears throat> posts. Why are you shouting every post, man? You're a smart freaking guy. Tell me, <clears throat> give, give me your, but it's like, we got to wake up. And so if we have a chance here to say, hey, wake up and ditch those processed foods as number one goal, just yeah. don't do it. Just make a stand. And by the way, there's so many fun ways to, work around that and buy the cookbook that has the keto brownies and mm -hmm. oh my gosh, you put in what's in there, mm -hmm. uh, almond flour and egg yolks and heavy cream and mm -hmm. whip it up and sprinkle coconut on top. It's delicious. You can, you can totally enjoy your life, but you got to get away from the, you know, the brand names and the shit that they're peddling down our throat. It's, it's, um, it's heading down a slippery slope these days. How do you uh, maybe advise some parents uh, go about um, you know, having a uh, better dietary practice inside the household. You must <laughs> yeah. have written about this before. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I was soccer Mark. coach, it was fun because like the, you know, the the helicopter moms would come in like 22 minutes into practice and be shoving Ritz crackers and, and grapes in the kid's face. And I'm like, get that food out. You know, <laughs> I'd always direct it to the kids so I wouldn't offend anybody, but I'd be like, <laughs> what do you need? We need food right now, man. I was, you need uh, to run. <laughs> I was so shocked when I went to uh, my daughter's uh, volleyball games and like she had like the tournaments and stuff. Mm -hmm. There was food like I thought like I thought like the Dallas Cowboys were going to show up or something <laughs> like there was so much food everywhere. I was like, who is this food for? Yeah. And these kids are only here for a couple hours. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> was it for her team and the opponents? It's for every, like it, it's like there's just like food everywhere because there's a bunch of different teams and a bunch of different. Um, oh, like at a sports facility where they have the snack. Bar. It's yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's like a free for all. It's, it's a tournament. And uh Parents bring food. There's food bar. There's a mm -hmm. food like thing Snack there. Bar. There's like taco trucks. There's like food every. Like I've never seen anything like it. There's food literally everywhere. There's Doritos and burritos and like it's just, Doritos. I was just like, what <laughs> in the hell? And it, I actually for my kids, I was like, I was I just I said ask the parents. I'm like, I know I'm like crazy fitness person, but like can we like bring better like yeah. I'll, I'll bring a bunch of healthy food and then if you guys could chip in and bring some healthy food like mm -hmm. like we want them to play well right like we don't want any <laughs> and and i was also like they're here for four hours like honestly they don't really need any food but to have some mm -hmm. nutrients here i guess makes some sense but Cur I'm like damn Curious about that real quick, and, I, and Brad, I don't mean to, to cut off the question, but, you know, when kids, because I was thinking about this, because I have my puppy growing, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I was like, well, you know, the kids, like, when they're growing everything, they, they probably, no one's tracking their kids' food, but, you know, if you want a kid to really 
grow. Like you'll see cases of kids that went from somewhat malnourishment to actually starting to eat a lot of food. And then they have like an eight inch growth spurt in a Mm -hmm. year, year and a half. You see Mm -hmm. that all the time Mm -hmm. because they're finally getting in enough calories. So yeah, you want to fuck the Doritos and shit, but like kids, if you you give them put fruit and all this other shit in front of them, they might still scarf all of it down because they're, they're growing kids, Mm -hmm. right? Oh, they'll eat it. Yeah. No, they like, as soon as we made some changes, they ate it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't like a speech of like, hey, let's only bring stuff that's like super healthy. Um, it was like, let's just have some better options. Absolutely. You know? And it, so what if they're like, I don't fucking care if there's like a sticky bun there or like a bagel or whatever. But at least now the kids, like if they're going to eat in between the games or have something in between the games, it's something small. It's something quick. It's something that's mm-hmm. going to digest fairly easy. Mm-hmm. And like a lot, like the first time that I saw it, like I saw a couple kids like eat like a muffin and then a bagel. And I was just like, that's just like, this is not great to do. I mean, we're going to be doing this every weekend. Like this doesn't (laughs) seem like a good idea. (sighs) Yeah, it's rough. I I've fought that battle hard with my kids, you know, they're 24 and 22 now. So, um, the, the, the the battle parts over, uh, but I always tried to, you know, have that healthy baseline in the house and, and encourage them to eat a good meal. And then like, it was a, it was a losing battle at a certain point because, you know, they're out and about, they'd stop at 7-Eleven and get a Slurpee after sports practice or whatever. Um, but I think the, the only thing you can do is like set an example mm-hmm. and, you know, do enough lecturing to where they have the knowledge and then they have a, you know, they're, they're making a well-informed decision. And, um, oh my gosh, I remember I used to brainwash my kids really good when they were little and we'd drive by McDonald's and I'd like, see that place? They're criminals because they feed food that kill people <laughs> and you can drive in and get the food that'll kill you later or you can go inside and it's McDonald's. They're evil. The M is evil. You know, turn on the side. And I, I'd do <laughs> that. Yeah, song yeah. Out of it. And um, <laughs> then like my son was in first grade and his first sleepover uh, party, <laughs> you know, and mom and I are worried like, okay, if you know, if you get scared, you can call us, you can always come home if you can't sleep. And, you know, he, he was like, you know, a little shy when he was a little kid. So we drop him off at the house. And um, then like we get the call. He wants to come home. And I'm like, what's wrong? <laughs> are, are you, you know, is, are you having a rough time? He goes, oh, it's great. But um, we went to McDonald's for dinner. I can't eat here. And I'm like, oh, my God. I was like, tears were coming to my eyes. Like, the, you know, the whole thing. He like internalized the whole thing. And he was scared. Like, he didn't want to go to McDonald's. Uh, I think <laughs> you I, I think I, criminal. Yeah. I think I met him there and brought him some snack oh, to take God. home, and the, the whole drama was alleviated. But um, he's like, you know, turned into a big culinary guy, big athlete, and he's really cool. into healthy eating. And you know, I kind of like trusted the process because I think now we're on the we're in the era of you know over parenting, helicopter parenting, trying to navigate, mm. you know, you know, orchestrate your kid's life like with puppet strings, and it's it's better to just you know. They're going to make their own choices. They're going to make their own mistakes, hopefully, if you let them, right, if you don't protect everything. And then a lot of times they're going to come around and um, have, you know, values and uh, behavior patterns that you set a good example for. But there's, you know, there's no guarantee, but um, at least you put it out there. Try your hardest. Just on that same note, I had to have my wife remove uh, an app that she had on her phone to where she could, like, track my son's grades and stuff. And, like, she was just always up his ass about his Uh grades. And she was like always stressed about it. And I'm like, yeah. you know, the best way to alleviate that stress. She's like, what? I was like, get rid of that fucking app. Like, nice. He's not going to do his homework. Like yeah. he's not, he's just not. It's yeah. not going to happen because you yell at him more. Or it's yeah. not going to happen because you're more stressed out. Like that's not the solution. Yeah. And she, you know, she eventually got rid of it. And he'd like, I don't know. He he figured shit out enough to. <laughs> Get yeah. through high school or whatever he needed yeah. to do, it's, but it's, it's, there's just like a lot of hovering that parents yeah. do, and it's like, hey, you want to just not worry about your kid falling, then just fucking look the other way. Yeah, I mean, let it, him get, it's let tough him get to hit, do it. Let him get hit in the face with the ball. He's yeah. gonna be fine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the stakes are so high now yeah. that, like, in high school, if your kid gets a B, they're not going to Cal or UCLA. <laughs> right. If they get a single B, mm-hmm. you know, and um, if they don't get into accelerated sports in uh, elementary, middle school age, they're not going to start for the varsity basketball team, soccer, uh, whatever sport that's... And I think that's great. 
Uh, yeah, that's right. Amen. I mean, like that's going to shove you in the right direction. Yeah, hmm. yeah. You don't belong in that direction anyway. You yeah. didn't get the A. You didn't get the A. Yeah, yeah. You know, my sister okay. was um, a valedictorian at Yale. She was a high student. Jesus. She's a doctor and she was destined when she was in second grade um, after skipping first, you know, yeah. um, she was on that path. No one needed to bother her, or hound her about her homework. Mm-hmm. And I was not on that same destined path for the <laughs> Ivy League, you know, like my dad would try to, you know, convince me that the Ivy League was the best school. He went to Princeton, you know, and he was like, Princeton is a fine school. It's located in New Jersey. I'm like, Dad, I'm pulling a 2.8 at a shitty public high school in Los Angeles. I'm not Princeton material. He goes, oh, I think you should think about it. Don't rule it out. I'm like, well, they've already ruled me out. You yeah. know, I'm more a UC Santa Barbara kind of guy, you know, <laughs> the surfing, the running. Uh, but it's a good uh, reflection to think like, you know, our destinies are set and the mm. parents think they have more influence than they really do. And it's sort of like our ego or something where if I can be the biggest, best role model possible and uh, also, you know, uh, check their their grades on the app and keep them aligned and open up all the possible doors, then it's going to be wonderful. And boy, you know, to, to live through it where it doesn't go perfectly, it's mm-hmm. kind of like, all right, I can get over myself now and realize yeah. that, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of factors going on and um, you can't control it all. It's basically same with a dog, can't control it all. You just nope. do the best you can. <laughs> nope. Andrew, you got anything over there? I was just thinking about the, 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 you know, feeding my son. I've talked about it a lot on the podcast because I'm so proud of him. But, like, it, even when we're eating, like, uh, let's just say steak and rice, uh, when he gets, you know, a, a fork full of rice, he's just like, that, I don't want that. And, like, give me the good stuff. He wants the steak. But my wife made, she baked uh, some uh, blueberry, blueberry muffins the other day. And it was like he couldn't control himself. And it was just like interesting because like for his first birthday, I didn't want cake out, like no cake, like get that shit away from us. But then somebody eventually brought one and then like he didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, did the thing where like terrible, like just the whole situation is terrible, but like they put their finger in the frosting and then put it to his mouth and he just, he hated it. Ooh. I was like, this is great. But for some reason, like home baked muffins he was just like i don't want anything else but that so for us now i recognize that i'm like i'm going to throw away all of that shit because it just can't be in the house Mm -hmm. because what he does is he puts us in check um if i'm eating something that he can't have why the fuck am i eating it Mm. you know like if i'm eating a bowl of cereal or something he'll come up to me because this kid's always hungry he's one and a half years old oh my gosh he's always hungry and it's amazing but if I'm eating a bowl of cereal and he's just like, you know, pointing at it, I'm like, oh, you can't have it. And in my head, I'm having this conversation. Well, dad, how come I can't have it? But you can. It's like, oh, Ooh. well, you know, it's because, uh, yeah, you're right. So like, yeah. you know, so we talked about that on the podcast, too, is just like, oh, but I have kids. How can I, you know, have healthy food in the house or get rid of the unhealthy food? It's like, well, they don't shop for it. You do. You know, and so for my son, he definitely keeps me in check because he's always wanting to eat more and more. And all he eats is, I, I seriously, all he eats is like steak, um, like ground meat or ground beef and like bananas. <laughs> like he eats a fuck ton of bananas. It's amazing. Meat and fruit. Yeah. Just trying to keep him in that top 1% as Sean Baker told me. It's there like, you go. Yeah. So that's been, it's been, um, yeah, a learning experience. My daughter, she's 14. Um, she knows good or bad food, I guess, if you want to label something as good and bad. Mm. But with her, she will definitely go out and have the Doritos, the Oreos and stuff like that. So it's hard to uh, reverse, you know, stuff that's already been implanted there. Mm. But we're working on it. She's getting better. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. All right, sure thing. Thank you, everybody, for <laughs> checking in on today's episode. Uh, please drop some comments down below, and please make sure you guys like today's episode on the way out and subscribe if you guys are not subscribed. Uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z and Seema. Where are you at? And Seema Inyo on Instagram and YouTube and Seema Yin Yang on TikTok oh, and Twitter. My Brad, pen. where can people find you? Where am I at? Bradkerns.com. You find me. All kinds of fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Great you, to be with you guys. Yeah, Thanks thank you here. so much. You have a you have a blog that you post on, right? And you also have the a B-Rad podcast. podcast. It's all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you right so much on. for your time. I appreciate you, it. Guys. I'm at Mark Smelly Bells. Strength is never weak. This week is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.